Hi, this is Roger Moore, and you're listening to James Bond Radio. Hello, and welcome to James Bond Radio. This is episode 123, where today we're going to be talking to none other than Charles Helfenstein, author of The Making of the Living Daylights. With me, as always, is my good buddy and fellow Bond aficionado, Mr. Tom Sears. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very well, man. I'm excited to speak to Charles. It's always fun. Obviously, we had him on with uh, the when we back in the day when we did the Majesty's episode, because obviously he also wrote the Making of Honor Majesty's Secret Service as well, which is an all time classic Bond book. So uh, obviously, this time, you know, it was as soon as we finished that one, we were like, right, let's write this in the book. By the time we get to Living Daylights, here we are, like three years later or however long it's been. Um, <laughs> Um, we need to get Charles back, um, and and here he is. So it's it's going to be fun. I feel like we always learn something when we talk to Charles, and uh, and it's a good laugh as well. Definitely. Last time it was an absolute belter of an episode. He's his quality as well. You can tell he's such a Bond fan. Yeah. Obviously, you know he's written two books, but it's the detail mm. that he goes into that I love. Yeah. And you'll you know you'll read stuff, you'll see pictures that you've never seen before or never heard of before, and it you know it gives you a little tingle. It certainly it? It does, man. Tingle. It certainly does give you tingles. Yeah. Now uh, I was in 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 slightly unrelated but related news. I was listening to a a, a podcast, uh, a non Bond podcast uh, called the Adam Buxton Show. Um, just yes. having a listen. It was an interview with uh, with Edgar Wright, who you know, director of uh, most recently Baby Driver and 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 some some other movies like that. Um, and uh, a little story about uh, Timothy Dalton cropped up out of the blue, and I thought, you know what, we're going to have to include that on JBR. Obviously, from uh, Edgar Wright directed Hot Fuzz as well, so it was obviously that was the the Timmy connection. So should, should we have a quick listen to it because nice. I think it will make everybody laugh. Yeah, definitely. Let's, Let's play it. The only time when I felt quite out of my depth was doing a scene with Tim Dalton. Oh, he slapped you on the back pretty hard, right? When he slapped you on the back. <laughs> and like his, his character was supposed to be annoyed with my character, Tim yeah. Messenger. I'm the annoying local reporter. And he turns out to be, uh, spoiler alert, you know, one of the big bad guys in the village. And he comes and he had to clap me on the back. <laughs> like quite hard. But he really genuinely did, like, smack me on the back. And we did it several times. So after a while, my back was stinging. And also it would shock me every time so that I found it hard to deliver my line. <laughs> and uh, I think I said to him eventually, like, when you, you know when you slap me on the back there? That is quite hard. <laughs> do you have to do it quite that hard? And uh, he just looked at me like, what are you even doing here? <laughs> <laughs> that would be an even funnier situation if you were playing like a um, like a henchman in a Bond film. Yeah. Saying, um, Timothy, uh, in that scene there, you, you, when you hit me, you don't have to hit me. Quite I wouldn't that say hard. it in that voice. That's the voice you did. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to punch me quite so hard. It look real with film tricks. You can do it so that it doesn't actually hurt. I don't know if you know that, but I was thinking that like. Mate, no one's going to know if you just act slapping me on the back. They can put a sound in. You don't have to genuinely wind me every time. I, l I mean, he's amazing in the movie. I loved working with him. And mm. I, like, I think afterwards, you know, like, um, one of the best things about him, and this is not a bad thing at all. He's just one of those people that doesn't suffer fools gladly, mm. you know. But he's somebody also that I never really, I feel very fortunate that I didn't really have to explain how to do it. And I've had other situations where you do have to explain, like, oh, it would be so much funnier if you did it straighter. With Timothy, you never really had to say that. And like for somebody to come on and just nail the tone of it immediately, it was just like, oh, this is great. I couldn't think of somebody better doing that. And he slays every line that he does. It's just beautiful. But I do remember there was one thing, I'm not sure if I've ever told this story. This is actually almost going back to sort of David Walliam saying out loud the things that you're thinking. Yeah. So one of the things that would happen, and it would happen to him a lot, and I remember Nick Frost saying this thing about Timothy Darwin. He said, um, if he played James Bond, it's like as being as famous as a president. They're not former President Barack Obama or former President Jimmy Carter. They are President Jimmy Carter. Yeah. And Bond is exactly the same. You're always James Bond. So it was an interesting thing that out of all of those actors, Jim Broadbent, Simon and Nick, Billy White or Edward Woodward, by far the biggest amount of autographs would be for Timothy Dunn because he's Bond. And every person in that town, every publican in a location would seem to have a copy of The Living Daylights under their bar. Right. Somebody would be hiding in the bushes when we're shooting a scene saying, Oh, Timothy. And they'd have their Bond annual or something. 
So you'd see he'd bristle at it a little bit because yeah. he's trying to concentrate. And I'm sure if like, it's a blessing and a curse being James Bond. But I do remember, and this really made me laugh. We were standing in the town square. And you know that thing when parents have told their children that somebody's famous, mm-hmm. but the children have no idea who that person is. Yes, it's like my children. And, uh, and the parents have said, that man there is really famous. Like, go up and ask for his autograph. And maybe they've said he's James Bond, but the kids who come up and tug on his shoulder, and this is in between takes, come up, and this is what they say to Timothy. Excuse me, mister, are you famous? (laughs) And he just went, under his breath, he went, oh, fuck off. Like that. (laughs) To like an eight-year-old and a a six-year-old. Five minutes later, a policewoman comes up, says, Mr. Dalton, did you just swear at two children? And he says, uh, I don't think so. And he goes, well, they definitely think you did. No, a real police person. A real police person. Oh, my goodness. So they, the kids are told, said, that man swore at us. So the policewoman came up to Timothy Dalton and said, did you swear at these kids? He goes, uh, I don't believe so. He goes, well, <laughs> they definitely heard it. He says, or I, maybe I said under my breath, but I didn't intend for them to hear. I do apologize. So he apologized profusely. But I imagine the next part of the story that I imagine happening off screen is that that policewoman went back to the station and said, Oh my God, you never guess what happened today. I only had to tell off James Bond. How funny is that, dude? That is brilliant, man. That is that made me chuckle. I could just admit, poor Tim. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say things that you don't mean yeah. it. But um, yeah, he must have just like shaken his head. And yeah. the police coming over as well. He's not hilarious, <laughs> man, having to go and tell off Timothy yeah. Dalton. <laughs> Do you think, though, that like, Edgar Wright, I'm pretty sure he had the opportunity to sort of step in and say, oh, no, he didn't say that. Mm. But I bet he was just watching it. He was just standing back, just like chuckling himself, watching Tim getting like, you know, getting a telling off. It is funny, though, because I I imagine the way that went down, like the way he described that is like is like when Bond's pissed off in License to Kill and he's not happy and he's he's just got that like scowl. And he's like, you know, like after after Saunders has been chopped in half and he's like, yes, I got the message or whatever it is he's saying. I imagine it was in that same way. He's just like, oh, fuck off and it just ten- turned out to be like a seven-year-old kid <laughs> you know, I think, I do you, do you think he gave him the eyes yeah he, do you think well, he like looked down to him and gave him those steely eyes i feel like he the can't, shit he, out he's the not capable of not giving the eyes i don't think so i feel like that yeah. was definitely in there given the wolf stare and uh <laughs> and tell a small child to fuck off i think that's one of the funniest i've got things. a question for you actually go on in yes edgar wright yeah potential bond director or not because I've heard his name being banded about. Some people are, are definitely... Obviously, I'm big fans of the films that he's done. Some people think, okay, it's not quite Bond what he's done. Yeah. But what do you think? He's a massive Bond fan, huge Bond fan, Edgar Wright is. Well, I suppose... What What do I... Okay, so obviously he did like the Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and uh, the end of... What was the last one called? The end of... The World's, the World's End, End. I think it was. The World's um, End, yeah. There's that, right. and then obviously now Baby Driver. Um I've yeah. seen no. Has he done anything else that I wouldn't? Yeah, have he known? did Scott Pil- He did Scott Pilgrim, um, which was a decent film as well. Quite a, quite a geeky film, yeah. but like it was really good. And he's yeah, he's done a fair few things. Obviously, he did like the TV series Spaced, which is immense. In terms of Bond related stuff, Bond. I think Hot Fuzz would be the closest in terms. Of you've got the action. Obviously, you've got Timothy Dalton. You've got um, yeah, you've got. So it's obviously lighter hearted the majority of stuff I watched yeah. Baby Driver actually last week and it's really good couple of brilliant car chases in it and you, you know you've got the classic sort of heroes and villains and he's done he does that well alright um, sweet I, I, you know I think he'd do an alright job he's obviously he's, he's he's a massive Bond fan he gets it I, I'm pretty sure he would he'd sort of nail it he's, he's kind of like an outside choice mm. because he hasn't done that kind of area yeah. but I still think he should be in consideration right. I well I like the sound yeah. of the fact that he's a big Bond fan so that that's a, a check oh, in the box yeah, for me massive. but uh, yeah, we'll have yeah. To, we'll have to see good stuff in fact we were in fellow company with him when we were in the Sunday Times oh yeah and do you remember when they asked some people for their thoughts on um, well it must have been on Spectre wasn't yeah. it I'm it, assuming. it was like the, yeah. the f- and, best moments of Bond or something wasn't it it was like yeah that's 10, right yeah. oh yeah that's right and and he he was one of the ones alongside ah. um Alongside us, so, there we yeah. go. All right, cool, Happy good day. stuff. Well, let's uh, let's keep our out for that. Now, listen, right? I must yes. I must admit, right? And I we're going to talk about latest Bond news and stuff in a little while, right? 
Mm-hmm. Are you getting a little bit worried about Bond twenty five yet? Because we we last time we talked about this, we were like, yeah, we're gonna we're, it's gonna we're gonna find out something soon, you know. But like by the yeah. end of the summer, I'm sure we're gonna. And then I'm looking at the calendar, and I'm like, fucking hell, we're we're like we're nearly we're getting on for the end of July now. And we've still not heard anything. Are you starting to get a little bit worried, maybe? Because we've been very confident that it's going to start shooting in January or like next year, and we're going to get a 2018 release. Are you are you still confident or are you starting to get the little grains of doubt coming in? Because I must admit, I'm getting the first little yeah. grain in there. Well, I'm not – I'm still confident there's going to be a Bond film. Yeah. I'm still confident that Daniel is going to do the next one 100%. 100% I think yeah. he'll do the next one. As to when it's going to be shot and released, that's where things get a bit tricky. Yeah. I still think the whole distributor side of things needs to be sorted. Once they've got that, then then obviously I think things will move uh, a bit quicker. Um so yeah I do, but I know what you mean. Mm. It's just it's just patience, isn't it? It's it's so hard to be patient when you've got it something is. that you love and you're seeing all these other things being churned out all these other franchises and stuff and I know Bond's different. Yeah. But um I ultimately they they're waiting for they're waiting for the distributor. They're waiting for Daniel. Obviously he's 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 done his theater now. Yeah. They've produced that for him. He's done his uh, Logan Lucky and and one or two other bits and pieces. So I think it it's about getting the timing right mm. and and I still think it's going to happen. But I I yeah, I just he's, don't want to wait too much longer. Here's, here's <laughs> where I am with it, right? I'm starting right, to think okay. come on like I thought we'd have heard a little something by now like whether it's you yeah. know this dude is signed up to direct it or or something just a yeah. nugget. I thought we'd have heard something by now. And so I, I'm here's what I'm hundred percent convinced of. I'm hundred percent convinced Daniel's coming back, and it'll most likely be his yeah. last one. Hundred percent convinced yeah. of that. Um, whether it shoots next year or whether we they're just having an extra year off and doing 2019 instead is what I'm starting to maybe suspect a little bit. And I feel like yeah. by the time we hit, if we if we're in September, if we get to September and we've still not heard anything, then I'm thinking, okay, then we're probably looking at 2019 instead of 18 now. But in terms of a release or a shoot, so shooting I, 18, I, I'm release 19. They'll or... stick to like the, the Christmas, well, not Christmas, but like, you know, yeah. the, the sort of autumn, winter sort of so slot. October, yeah. But then again, I yeah. suppose you have to contend with a Star Wars movie coming out every year now. So it's like, when does that, you want to avoid the Star Wars window, obviously. So it's like, it's, yeah, yeah it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how, how it plays out. But I must admit, I'm getting my first little twitches of shit. I think we might have an extra year to wait this time. And uh, uh, on the forums, like the message boards, everyone's saying the same thing. Um, you know, on Facebook every day, it's like, ah, is there any more Bond 25 news and what's happening? Why are Eon not giving us what we want and all that sort of stuff? So there's a lot of unhappy people. Yeah. I think it's kind of out of their hands. I think if they could do a Bond film, they would do one. But I think there's there's there are other things that we're not privy to, which is why yeah. it's sort of holding holding it up a little bit. Yeah. But th- but obviously, let's there's, there's go on to the Bond 25 stuff. So So... We just heard recently that they're going to be uh, they've greenlit a, a thriller, a female led thriller with Blake Lively called the Rhythm Section. Yeah. Now that's Eon Productions. That is obviously that's yeah. Eon Productions. Yeah. So this is Barbara and Michael they're going to be um, sort of producing this. So that's an interesting thing. So we've got another sort of thriller um, type thing. Now we don't know when that's going to be shooting, but one presumes yeah. That's, before so, Bond okay. twenty five. So there's been a lot of. Being, I tell you what. With this this is yeah. there's a lot to talk about here right so for example yeah so obviously there was the thing that came out and was it the daily mirror the other day that saying daniel's definitely signed up for bond 25 and adele's coming back for the theme tune yeah, yeah, and it's like yeah. oh come on and all of a sudden everybody's going oh so he has signed up it's like oh, just wait a minute right until we hear from the man himself or barbara rockley yeah. this is just another dose of it's a slow note news day let's stick some bond stuff out there and just get some attention there's that's not a news report as far as i'm concerned it's just more rumors there's nothing concrete there's been no official word so that for me that news report is totally worthless there was a rumor that came out the other week about how the 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 eon are getting universe fever and they're looking at what marvel are doing and all that kind of stuff and they want to do that for bond as well which is something we've sort of talked about roughly recently and i'm like huh now personally i can't see that working i can't see like if you're going to make a series about a lot of people saying oh you should do like other double o's no 
I don't think you should do that because that's going to eat into the world of 007. Like, I'm not interested yeah. in what 009 is doing, right? I'm not interested. I want to... Unless it's a very brief moment within the exactly. film and then he dies. I want a cameo <laughs> in, a, in a 007 adventure. I don't want to see what, yeah. you know, Harry Broadbent 009 is up to. Not interested, right? I don't want a standalone Money Penny film. I don't want a standalone Felix film. I just don't think... I don't mm. think those characters, they're supporting characters. I don't think they can carry a full movie. And I think it would just eat into it. I don't think a universe of movies is the right way to go for Bond. What do you think about that? I'm 100% behind you on that, 100%. Yeah. Like, it, it just wouldn't work. And also, how would they reference it within the film? It, yeah. it would just jar so much. And people talk about the time continuity of Bond being a bit all over the place, which, to be, you know, yeah. it, it is, really. That would just make it a million times worse if you're having, like, sort of all these other things going on. So I think... The idea to expand is a good one, but not within the Bond universe. So this is a perfect example because back, you know, quite a year or two ago, there was all talk about having a Jane Bond and all this. And mm. you're like, well, obviously we can't do that. And that's a stupid idea. Female character that's an assassin. Brilliant idea. Just just yeah. keep it away from the Bond world. <laughs> well, have well, it as its it. own thing. And let, this is let, kind of what they're doing now. So that makes let, sense. Let me read out the little press release, right? So this is from The Hollywood Reporter. Yeah. Blake Lively to star in spy thriller from Bond producers. I am very partial to Blake Lively. I would just like to put that out there. Mm. Um, Blake Lively yeah. is set to star in an espionage thriller from James Bond producers, Eon Productions, and IM Global. The rhythm section, an adaptation of the first book in Mark Burnell's former novel series, uh, will be produced by Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson of Eon Productions. Um, the rhythm section follows heroine Stephanie Patrick, who, after the death of her family in an airplane crash on a flight that she was meant to be on, discovers the crash was not an accident. She then seeks to uncover the truth by adapting the identity of an assassin to track down those responsible. Now, I think this is where that universe rumor came from. They're interested in branching out and doing some non-bond stuff, some other other things. And that's a spy thriller about an assassin. So you yeah. could so easily the, the the Chinese whispers of the of the the rumor mill starts churning, and all of a sudden that's a that's a within universe film. I think that whole universe thing is bollocks, and I think essentially that's yeah. where that's come from. Is they they're doing a you know that's essentially a female spy assassin movie, which is you know where all the rumors of Jane Bond and all that bollocks comes from. And I think that's what we're actually looking at when the truth is revealed would you would you agree with that i would and i think that eon eon aren't stupid yeah. you know they know what they're doing and and all these rumors about the extended universes and jane bonds and whatever they know that's a pile of shit yeah. you know they know that that's not a good idea they're not they're not stupid yeah. you know we can see that by by what they've done so far so i think it's a case of just having a bit more faith in them yeah and i know it's hard when it comes to bond because of the delay that's been but that's i don't i still don't think that's their fault they want daniel they're going to wait for daniel yeah. they're going to wait for the white time um but yeah no i think i think they i think they're playing it right i think it's good yeah. this and, I'll, I'll be up for and at the watching end of the, whatever at the end of the day as well i don't think they owe us a bond film all the time Do you know what it's I mean? a weird way of it's, yeah. it's a weird way of thinking that it's yeah. almost like some of the fans think they own bond yeah. and they own eon and it's a weird way of thinking yeah. i've never like i love bond you love bond you know we've got a big passion for it but we don't own the character no. we're just fans of it and I, and you get some people out there and they and they get angry mm. and it's almost like they feel as if they are you know they own part a percentage of bond yeah. and it's not it's not you know the world doesn't work that way exactly and i feel like there's 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 that thing of like you know it's us that have made it popular by going and watching the films it's like well you know we hand over 10 pound 50 to go and watch a film it's a pretty fucking good exchange if you ask me it's a tenner out of your yeah. life do you know what i mean to be entertained <laughs> yeah. for the rest of your life by a, by a single film so i don't i feel like if they're in the mode where and this reminds me of what daniel said when he did that interview in uh, new york recently or last year where he was like you know everybody's just a bit tired i feel like if they're at a stage of the game where they just they want to try some different stuff they want to they want to do something outside of the world of bond then all the power to them and it's like i would rather they do that and then come yeah. back refreshed 
and they've had a little break and they're like, right, let's really make a kick-ass Bond film rather than just trotting out another formula sort of like, let's just stick to the formula and trot this next film out. You know, like they could have been guilty of in the past. Do you know what I mean? It's like, let's just do the next one. Like, you know, you hear a lot of people say that about the Brosnan era. It's just like, it's just the same film again, but you know, with some different stuff happening. I would much rather yeah. them come back rested and be genuinely enthused by making the next one film. Cause let's not forget for them, it's work, man. It's not like, it's yeah. not this magical thing. It's like, it's work and they need to, they need to like, they need to do what they have to do to get the job done. And even if we have another five year break, it'll be gutting and we're like, damn. But ultimately if they come back with Casino Royale two, do you know what I mean? Like not obviously a literal sequel, but like yeah. that level of quality. Again, it's like, it's totally yeah. worth the wait because you know, it's, it's, it's part of the creative process. That's the way I look at it anyway. I- no, completely. And who's to say that's not being worked on now? We already It was already confirmed that Purvis and Wade were working on the script. Yeah. So who's to say they haven't already done two or three drafts? Yeah. Who's to say Daniel hasn't read it in his downtime and given his feedback on it? Yeah. Um, you know, that could be going on in the background, making it, you know, improving the script, you know, month by month yeah. until when it finally is ready to shoot, it'll be so much better. Totally. So you know that's probably going on as we speak yeah man i i I think let's just let's give them the time like whatever they have to do to get to the point where bond 25 is a thing then all the power to them as far as i'm gonna say um it's not like there aren't other films that we can we can watch in the meantime do you know what i mean we can we can you know we can do and then it's even more special when you finally get there you know what i mean when it finally comes out it's like yeah bring it on brilliant stuff but uh but saying that i'd love to hear a few rumors yeah (laughs) yeah just a little bit of news just to keep us (laughs) just 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 a little bit you know a little bit yeah that would be nice yeah. but uh i think uh yeah a director would be an interesting one uh obviously that'd yeah. be good yeah because um, we, we a couple of the story strands we obviously um, got the, maybe, uh, maybe the car he's gonna use the watch he's gonna yeah, use, you know something. maybe what suit he's wearing maybe you know the you old know, uh, well, who's gonna be the bond girl because we got the we got the <laughs> mendez sort of stuff didn't we where he was signed on as a consultant and stuff when there was all the all the delays for skyfall and it was just like okay well there's a little bit of a bit of nugget but yeah man I, now, I, i'd be i'd definitely go and see the rhythm section like i would definitely support the you know support what ian are doing and i'm like that sounds like a movie i'd enjoy and like i say i'm very partial to some blake lively so i'll be i'll happily go and watch Mm -hmm. that so uh so yeah you know and then maybe they will cross paths and they'll do a a bond versus blake lively (laughs) crossover movie and it'll be like the avengers what do you think uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> enough of that yeah cool we'll see we'll see so right uh, yes now i tell yes. you what the uh you do we we got so excited about bond 25 there for a minute we 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 skipped over some very important news which is obviously you gallivanting around france mm-hmm. and visiting loads of bond locations with the jbr family operation chateau hand so tell us about that yes. how did it go right it was Absolutely brilliant. Um, do you know what? It was kind of nerve wracking from the point that I pretty much organised it. I think we had 13 people in the end, 13, 14 people. So it wasn't a massive, massive crowd, but it's still like a decent number. And, you, and you've obviously got to sort out everything that you can. Mm. Um, but aside from the weather, which I'll talk about in a minute, everything went off perfect. It was great, you know. Um, so we on the Friday, we went to Chateau Chantilly. So this is the one from A View to a Kill, Zorin's Gaff. And it was, it is, the great thing about these is they don't change one point. Mm, Obviously, yeah. it, it was exactly the same as it was during filming. And the, with that one, so much of the chateau and the surrounding grounds were were used in the film, like a good 40 minute screen time or something like that. Um, so the sort of areas we looked at, we, obviously that gate, you know, when, when they rock up in the rolls yeah. and Scarpine is there to greet Bond, Mr. Sinjin Smith and, um, you <laughs> know, uh, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that was brilliant. So we went there. We went, we saw the balcony where Bond and Tibbet were sort of, you know, standing outside. The little courtyard where Jenny Flex walked down the stairs. Um, the bit where um, uh, Tibbet was washing the rolls where Bond comes over and chats to him. At the staircase where he's walking up with the bags, I'm an early riser myself. Oh, yeah. That was it was so man, it was so good just to be there. Um, and they've got the sort of stables the other side of it. Um, so we went over there. Well, we were halfway over there. We were actually stuck under a tree for about 20 minutes because it the heavens like yeah. just unleashed, and we were trying to make it, seeing if it would stop, and it didn't. So we did a bit of Bond sneaky, you know, jump running from tree <laughs> to tree, and we found what was really cool. We eventually we found this little grotto completely out of the blue we went down these stairs and found this sort of grotto and it almost looked like 
um, you know, like a crypt. The roof of it mm. was kind of half crypt-like and half natural rock. And it would have been great to use in the film. It wasn't massive, yeah. but it, it reminded me a bit of the one in Pinewood from uh, The World Is Not Enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, and eventually we made it to the stables and, and sort of saw all the scenes from there. Um, you know, where he's looking at Ithacus and all that sort of thing. And then after that, we went over to the, you could see the grandstand. It was like right over the other mm. side of the track. So it was a bit of a walk. Um, and myself and Agent Carr, Jason Carr, we, we sort of got there ahead of the others. And this gate was open. So we just walked in all nonchalant and stuff like that and carried on walking. It looked as if there was going to be a party on. But we ended up walking to the far side of the far side of the grandstand and and it had changed. It was a bit of a shame. I mean, you could still see it was the same. So this is the part where Mayday lifts up the KGB yeah. broke and, you know, all that. And so it was a great little bit. And we got to the right stand, but it had changed a bit. But then we got this message on our phone and, and the message was like, guys, guys, get out, get out. Someone's after you. <laughs> and we were like, what's going on? So basically the whole place had been closed. And when the others tried to get in, security told them to go away. And like um, they were now searching for for me and James, no so we were like just just sort of receiving these messages telling us to get out. But we just sort of stayed and had a few photos, and then we had to climb over this fence to get out on the far side. So there's a good bit of bond sneaking. Very that nice. Day. Who was pretending um, to be yeah. Mayday? Um, oh, well, there's only the two of us there, so I think uh, he was. Yeah. I think Jace was. Oh, yeah. Cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I tell, I tell um, you what I liked. So yeah. I was obviously watching the Periscope videos and stuff you were doing. Uh, I was I was taken aback by the amount because you know, typically speaking, you get an exterior shot or an ex, an outdoor scene, and that's you know on location. And then when you have an indoor sort of scene, it's typically speaking is on a on a soundstage somewhere. But I was taken aback yeah. at how many of those scenes from from you know your Moonrakers and, and all that kind of stuff, especially Moonraker, actually, was actually there in the chateau that you, you were at. And oh, you were like, yeah. there, are the, that's the, the very spot that, you know, he picked the little lock or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. wicked, that, isn't it? That was great. So, yeah, so the, they all, we also went to the gardens where Zoran had his garden party. And then, you know, that little footbridge where uh, Bond and mm. Stacey are having a, a, a champagne sort of thing. So we went there. That was good. So on the Saturday... We did quite a bit of driving, but we are, oh, this was immense. So we went to Chateau Denay. This is the one from the Thunderball pre titles. Oh, yeah. Mate, it was so good. So we got an extra, we were quite lucky. Um, we got an extra part of the tour, not normally given to the tour that they do. Um, and we got taken onto the roof section where um, obviously the jetpack where Bond comes out nice. running, puts on the jetpack yeah. and takes off. So we did a little bit of reenactment. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but um, yeah, we, there might the be a little video, video flying around It was around amazing. Somewhere. It was so good. The Invisible Helmet is one of my favourite oh, yeah. pieces of filmmaking I've ever seen. I loved it. So good. Yeah, man. I'm what glad you liked trip. it, man. So let, yeah. who, who, who was with you then? Let's have some name checks. Of okay, JBR so yeah, members. definitely. So, okay, so there was Agent Ettel, Agent Jameson, Agent Noble, Agent Cooper, Agent Dobson, Agent Andrews, Agent Nibs, Agent Gardner, Agent Blundell, Agent Carr, Agent James, and Agent Fish. Very nice. So there's a good, good crowd of us. Um, and we went into, you know, the part, the stairway where the widow sort of walks up the stairs. Yeah. Um, but, but the room where they had the fight, exactly the same. Uh, okay, a bit of furniture yeah. changed. But we saw that fireplace where he was strangling the guy with the poker. Yeah. We saw the actual chair that Connery was sitting in at the start. No you know, where he's, he's yeah, yeah, that chair was there. Um, but the trouble with this one was you had to stay in the guided tour. And at the start, they said no photos, no videos. Yeah. And there were sort of barriers that you couldn't cross over. So we did a little, again, a little bit of Bond Sneaky, got a few photos and a few little video clips. Nice. But that room was just amazing. It was like walking into it in 1965. Oh, and it just looked the same, man. Yeah. That, was, that was probably one of my favorite things it, and there was a little chapel as well you know the part where at the very very start where you've got the coffin with gb yeah. that has your initials gb yeah. um it was so we went in that chapel and you could see the balcony which unfortunately we weren't allowed to go up to but you could see the balcony where bond and um, madame was laporte were on, on on both inside and outside and um, yeah it, it exactly the same beautiful it's so good that's wonderful yeah I sp especially when it when you're getting into those original sort of four or five bond films finding those locations intact is is they're very few and far between aren't they do you know what i mean it's like obviously when you went to istanbul a few years ago and you you're yeah. in the in the big mosque and stuff where there's all those key yeah. scenes from rush with love it looks exactly the same now as it did then and then you, you know what i mean it, it it must be like stepping back in time to like almost like walking into 
of the movie, I, I guess. Yeah. But I, I was. I it saw somebody was. took a photo of the balcony that he, that Connery and is stood on at the very beginning. You know, when they're they're talking and looking over the, the funeral ceremony. Um, yeah. But you yeah. couldn't get up there. Is that right? You can actually. No, get up there. I mean, I could have maybe scaled up the inside and climbed up some statues to get to it, but I didn't want to be chucked out. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> There's too too many tourists around, but no. But it was still brilliant that one. And um, and then we went obviously on the Sunday, the last day we went to um, Chateau Vaux le Vicomte from uh, Moonraker. This was brilliant as well. This one just for sheer opulence. It's just one massive huge stately mansion mm. place and it it's incredible it really is and again looked exactly the same so we went and had a little tour around the inside there were only two rooms um from the interior of the chateau that were used so there is the entrance way you know where bond and corin walk in and kevin just greets them yeah um yeah so there is that and in the corner it's so good so in the corner um like Darren Noble, he's brilliant. He, he had this still shot of, uh, you know, Chat when he's um, keeping a lookout for Bond yeah. and he's hiding there when Bond sneaks out and there's a, like a crack in the wall. Yeah. So he found it and, and basically we called it, oh, there's Chang's crack. Very nice. And so we had, we had like every one of us basically posed, <laughs> did the exact same pose for a still shot. And this woman who obviously worked there was wondering what we were doing because there, there's this brilliant architecture. There's this <laughs> ceiling with like a, an amazing painting on it, all these sort of statues. And there's like a group of about 13 people standing around this crack in the wall, all taking photos of it. Um, and yeah, so Love she did it. come over. She thought, I think we were up to something dodgy, but um, we got we got that down. I can imagine. And then there was another room, um, the library, which again looks exactly the same. So this is the room where... Bond finds, you know, Drax is safe mm. uh, and opens a clock and then it comes out. And that looked uh, – same desk as well oh, from the mate. film, which is brilliant. Um, now, so that, yeah, I have a question. So there would be one particular thing I would want to see from that particular yes. location. You know, there's always one thing you're like, that's the key thing I want to have a look at. Look at. Did you find yeah. the tree? Mate, yes, we did. And it, in fact, Simon Gardner found it. And I don't think it took him long. We we were kind of split up because the walk, you can get these mini golf carts, you know, mm. like um, Corian has in the film. And we were going to hire them. But um, I think it was something like a 200 euro deposit or 500 euro deposit or something stupid. Yeah. And we we're just like, oh, that doesn't look too far. So yeah. we started walking. And then we realized there was a massive bit of water um, that you had to uh, walk around. So it took a little while, but we got up there. And and uh, so we went. Oh, that's the other thing we did. So we went to the point, you know, where the astronauts were doing the training. Yeah. Um, so we basically lined that up exactly as it was in the film, and we all had to go. So we we're all doing our exercises, nice. doing our stretches, and our jumping jacks and stuff like that. Um, I think there might be a video of that somewhere as well. So that's worth checking out. Um, yeah, and then we carried on. So we went up to the forest at the back, and it's got that massive statue of Hercules, like it does in the film. Um, but everything again. Like it's a forest and you think it would be hard to spot, mm. but it looks exactly the same. The tree, I think Simon found like within a minute or something. It, it, the way that it's sort of set up, the branches are like there's a forked branch mm. and it looks just like it did in the film. Um, and I was, I so wanted to get up there, but it is, it's bloody high. It was like about maybe, I don't know, what, 30 feet. But, but there was no, you know, they obviously would have had a ladder to get up there. It didn't have any branches yeah, yeah, lower yeah. down to climb up because obviously I would have been up there like straight away if I could have done. Um, <laughs> but we, we still had a few decent shots. Yeah. And there's something that I did, which I'm really gutted that it didn't turn out. I basically went to the other side and I reenacted Corinne Dufour's run through the forest. So I was on Periscope at the time um, and... Um, but the signal was really mm. bad there, which is a shame. So so I managed to get it and I was just sort of saying, right, I can hear the dogs. And I started running. Um, and what I didn't know is my phone had cut out straight away. But I continued running for about a minute <laughs> or two minutes through this forest, <laughs> jumping over logs and like getting, you know, getting wet and everything. Um, but yeah, so that that was awesome. Nice. That was really good. Sounds like a bloody yeah. good trip, man. It was, uh, it's, I was gutted I couldn't make it. But uh, what a good trip. Yeah. Good times had by all by the looks of things. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, might even do it again sometime. It was, uh, you know, it's definitely three brilliant locations worth visiting. Um, so, yeah, highly recommend it. Cool stuff. We're talking about yes. Bond locations, obviously, we've uh, cool. the, the tickets for Bond stars were released recently, weren't they? And oh, look at that. You got a fucking sign I as just, well. Sorry, look at that. I forgot. We got a sign. And also, uh, this is for people that are um, listening. We had a few signs and banners made up That's so for cool. uh, Operation Shadowhand. So I'm just getting them out <laughs> to show everyone. Very nice. 
That's pretty cool, isn't it? Best, thanks yeah, to James Blundell for that. Proper bit of That's signage. Great. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. So obviously the uh, the Bond Stars uh, event at Pinewood have been released. Luckily, you and I have got tickets, so we're going to we're gonna yeah. be there. Uh, JBR listeners, Ruben Wakeman and Dale McFadden are both going as well. Congratulations to you, dudes. Anybody else, any other JBR family members who have got tickets, let us know, uh, and we'll be sure to uh, say hello when we see you there in September. But mm. uh, it should be it should be a cracking day. I'm, I'm i'm very much looking forward to it oh without a doubt it'll be it'll be brilliant obviously last year was great it's just a shame that obviously they i think they limit it to 200 or whatever yeah. it is i'm sure they get like a thousand or whatever people yeah. applying and i know probably pretty much the majority of jbr listeners or at least uk based ones would have applied so hopefully um there are more than you know we know about yeah. and hopefully next year there'll be more but it's going to be a cracking month because the month, that's actually the week end before casino royale um at the royal albert hall so just to give that a shout out yeah um 30th of september saturday tom and myself a whole load of the jbr listeners are going to the 230 showing so this is they're playing casino royale with a live orchestra at the royal albert hall it's going to be immense mm. i know quite a few are going to the evening show as well we're going to meet up with people go for drinks and stuff so if anyone is around Obviously, let us know and we'll uh, we'll have some chit chat on board. We'll hang out. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. I cannot wait for that. It's going to be a good. It's two weekends one after the other. I'm very excited for that. It's going to be. It's going to be bloody good. Now, in in somewhat sad news, we uh, we we lost a Bondian brother recently in Joe Robinson, also known as Peter Franks. Who is your floor? Yeah. Uh, he <laughs> passed away recently at the grand old age of ninety, which is that's a good well, age. It's a good man. solid. A good it's age. a good solid innings, isn't it? Um, yeah. but uh, but yeah sadly Peter Franks is no longer with us and I tell you what man you look at pictures of, of Joe Robinson that dude aged beautifully he looked pretty much the same at 90 as he did in Diamonds Are Forever as far as I'm concerned wow yeah that's I wonder what the magic was yeah I getting, don't know I guess that getting into a lift with Sean Connery I guess yeah <laughs> just, yeah I don't know maybe it's that sandy colour hair you just uh, you know you yeah. just age a little bit better I don't know well. but uh, yeah but yeah so in a, before we, we crack on with uh, with our interview with Charles a few more little nuggets obviously we did the uh, the Sir Roger Unicef collection uh, after he passed yeah. away um, I just wanted to say a big thank you we had the original target of a thousand pounds and the total is currently at one thousand five Five hundred and eleven pounds and sixty-eight p. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah. If there are any any people that haven't donated yet, in the in the good name of Sir Roger, um, if you go to jamesmanradio.com forward slash Roger, that'll sort of redirect you to the Just Giving page, and that's just not that's not just a UK thing as well. Wherever you are in the world, you can donate in any currency, and it all goes towards uh, the the total and, and UNICEF. And uh, that's, you know, obviously Sir Roger's charity of choice that he worked for for all those years. So that will be cool if you haven't donated yet. It, it, it definitely will. And and the way that it works with Just Giving is the or with UNICEF is they take the money every week. So initially I was going to put it up for like a certain amount of time. But every time I thought, well, I'll finish, finish it now, a few more more donations would come in mm. so whatever you whatever you know whatever you're donated by the end of that week it's gone straight to unicef yeah. which is fantastic and thanks yeah everyone that donated so far it's brilliant brilliant amount we've raised but any any you know anyone that hasn't and wants to any go to, uh, yeah. go to the link yeah exactly absolutely so that would uh, be much appreciated one more time is james from radio.com forward slash roger if you go there you'll get redirected to the page so last couple of bits of of news then uh good old cue the music are out on tour this year 2017 uh, they're doing a, a, a few yeah. shows so if you're a super fan make sure you book as many tickets for as many shows as you <laughs> as you can because go to all of them just get, yeah. fuck it why not go to all of them <laughs> and uh, yeah and, and show your support because you'll have a, a bloody good night and you'll enjoy yourself reeling off the dates are you ready pens and papers at the ready yes. on the 23rd of July there's Eastbourne Bandstand which is in Eastbourne on the 18th of August it's the Harlington Theatre in Fleet that's in Hampshire the 20th of August is the Buxton Opera House in Derbyshire. On the 24th of September, it's the New Theatre Royal and uh, New Theatre Royal. Sorry, I got all casino on everybody there for a minute. <laughs> New Theatre Royal in Lincolnshire, and then the final one is on the 1st of December at the Camberley Theatre in Surrey. And if you need any more details, go to cuethemusicshow.com forward slash see the show. That's cuethemusic.com forward slash see the show. So make sure you go and catch Cue the Music, especially if you haven't seen them before come on get involved 
Definitely. It's a night to remember. Mm. I mean, we've been lucky enough to see them a couple of times and it's always a blinding night. And again, quite a few of the listeners are going, I think to every single one, but I know there are loads going to the Cambly one. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, going to be at that one and it's always a brilliant night. Lovely you stuff. Know, you get blown away. Mm. You know, that's yeah. that's what you go there Literally, for, that's, that's, the, the, <laughs> that's the bit at the end. That's the tagline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get yeah. blown away. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good stuff. I could take that further, but I'm not going to. I'm going to restrain myself because I'm, you know, I'm not, no. I don't want to lower the tone. Um, now, you have right. seen two trailers recently that you quite enjoyed, didn't you, Chris? Yes, and both are very much Bond related. So obviously, we mentioned briefly earlier Daniel Craig in Logan Lucky. And now, if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth checking out. It's been out a little while now, but he plays this sort of a convict, but he's, he's a cracking character. It's like, it's really good humor delivery sort of thing. Um, and that looks great. So that's going to be out soon. The other one I saw, which really looks good, is called The Foreigner. Now, this one is uh, Pierce Brosnan is sort of like an IRA boss type character. Mm-hmm. Jackie Chan is kind of like the hero character and it's directed by Martin Campbell. And the trailer for that looked looked awesome as well. So that was the two one. really good yeah. films. To look Do you remember out for. in the in the newspaper when they they blew up a, a London bus on one of the bridges as part of oh, a stunt, yeah. and everybody thought it was a terrorist attack for real? But it was yeah, it was it was part of the movie. So it was if you remember that news story a few years back, that's that's this is obviously the film that that happens in. But uh, but yeah, always good to see uh, the Bond brotherhood out there in uh, in other movies. I see what that Logan Lucky trailer is. It's you see Daniel being very very funny in it, don't you? It's like yeah. it's he was pre Spectre. I would have said not a comedic actor at all, like just not a funny dude. Like you know what I mean? Just Although not a funny his dude. timing in Casino is good, that is true. He, he's good, but then there's. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not like it's not. There's not a great deal of no. humor in it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas yeah, yeah. you know, obviously, there's a lot more humor in Spectre. And in this trailer, I feel like he's he's gone way off the other side in the sense that it it actually genuinely looks hilarious. So I'm 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 going to yeah. really look forward to seeing that one for sure. Now. This is the part yes. where I do my my usual spiel, but it's changed this week mm-hmm. because James Bond Radio is now on Instagram, everybody. So make sure you come and follow us on Instagram. If you put in James Bond podcast, type that in, you will find us. Come and follow us. Good old Agent Dobson, B Dobbs, Brian Dobson is uh, is taking care of that for us. He's posting some cool Bond images pretty much every day of the week. So uh, make sure you come and follow us on Instagram as well. I'm sure you and I will pop up on the you know on the Instagram stories and stuff from time to time and, and all that kind of stuff. So make sure you come and follow us on Instagram. Make sure you come and like us on Facebook. Just put James Bond Radio into the Facebook search and you'll find us. Follow us on Twitter, which is at James Bond Radio. Also follow us on Periscope because you're going to get access to the the video streaming backlog where there's videos of me and you running around the garden at Pinewood and exploring (laughs) and showing famous scenes and stuff and then obviously your trip uh, to France there with Operation Shatterhand all those videos are going to be there so you can catch up with the JBR family and see what they got up to on that trip and you're going to see some cool stuff on there Come to jamesmonradio.com where we've got the blog over there. Uh, all sorts of cool stuff as managed by Jack Lugo. That's always good. Always good stuff going on and you know you can get involved in the comment section and stuff. Make sure you come and subscribe on iTunes to the podcast. If you just go to the, the iTunes store and type in James Bond Radio, you will find us. Over on the website, there's also the SpeakPipe link. Leave us a voicemail. Um, so if you want to leave us a trivia question or a quote or just say hello or tell us you think we're rubbish, just come and do that. You can do that on your phone or you can do it over over your computer on the, on the right hand side of the page just click the link and you're away and then last but not least obviously there's the donate link as well over on the website if you want to help keep the good ship jbr afloat never expected always appreciated so uh, if you fancy doing that that's always lovely other ways you can help you can post about jbr on social media share our podcast pod, pod Cast posts. Post. That's very difficult to say. <laughs> Share our podcast posts um, and all that kind of stuff. Get involved on Bond forums and you know just stir up a little bit of conversation about JBR because that's always good. Uh, good old fashioned word of mouth being the uh, the number one way people typically find JBR. So speaking about donations, we have yes. to reel off a list of thanks, don't we? Because some of the JBR family have Ooh, kindly do. donated. So take it away, Chris. Who have we had donations from? Okay, so this a massive thanks out to everyone that's donated so far for the. J- JBR cause. So big thanks shout out to Jeff Silence, Brian Quaist, Tom Clark, Lotten Limborg, Jeff Banks, Kevin Fitzgerald, Brian Dobson, Andrew Melton, Stephen House, 
Aaron Noble and Chris Green. Lovely. You are top class people. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. Much, much, much appreciated. So then, without any further ado, actually, we've got a little bit more ado. I'll be honest. So we we're do. not going to talk to Charles yeah. just yet. We have, just before we talk to Charles, we have the listener bond trivia question of the week from Mr. Mm-hmm. Christian Evangelista. So shall we see what question Christian has for us? Hey, Tom and Chris, this is Christian Evangelista, your man in Washington. And I have a trivia question for you and all my fellow JBR listeners. What is the name of the very particular cuff that Sean Connery wears on his shirts in all of his films except Goldfinger? So that would be in Dr. No, From Rush With Love, Thunderball, You Only Live Twice, Diamonds Are Forever, and in Never Say Never Again. And for a bonus, who are the two other actors who portrayed James Bond who wore these cuffs in their films and which films? Thanks again for the show, and I'll be back with the answer. All right, good stuff. That's a good That's a good yeah. question. I, I feel like I'm pretty confident in the first question, but with the bonus question with the other, with the other Bond actors, I'm not 100% sure on that one. So that's yeah. that's a, a very good one, Mr. Evangelista. I feel like Christian Evangelista would, would have featured in a Bond novel somewhere, don't you, with a name like that? I, w- I would say he's uh, he's he's in License to Kill. Yeah, yeah. And he's uh, yeah. Part, of, part of the, uh, yeah, the Sanchez know, the, Posse. The TV yeah, thing. absolutely. Yeah, that's right, yeah. definitely. Collecting donations. Alongside, yeah. that's it, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, good question, though, yeah. tough question. Good, good but, yeah, nice one. Nice one, Christian. Okay, then, without any further ado, it's time to talk daylights, Chris, and we are joined mm. once again, of course, by the author of The Making of the Living Daylights, Mr. Charles Helfenstein. Let's get cracking. My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion of all things 007. Pussy. As you can see, I have no problem with your personality. Oh, break down 007. Do you expect me to talk? No, oh, Mr. Bond, I expect you to buy. So we'd just like to welcome to the show author of The Making of the Living Daylights as well as The Making of Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Mr. Charles Helfenstein. It's great to have you back, Charles. Thank you so much. I, I really loved my my first appearance on the show. It's <laughs> it's nice to uh, better make that too. <laughs> hey, I like it. This is starting very off well good. already. <laughs> very good. Very good. Unbelievable. That's great, Charles. Well, in, in the meantime, since we last spoke to you, both Tom and I have had a, a good read through, obviously, the Majesty's book, which is fantastic, and now the Daylight's one. And we've had so many comments from the listeners just saying, that they love how detailed the books are, how much backstory they go into, and uh, just everyone wanted to say thanks for for putting out some decent bomb books. So, cheers for that, <laughs> then, Charles. <laughs> That's um, that was my goal, and you know, I, I think we've we've all bought books that we've had high hopes for and, and had, you know, gotten disappointed. And that's, I was not going to do that to my audience. Mm-hmm. And, um, these, these books are in, in a way, first of all, for me that, you know, I wanted to know this information and, um, that, that was what drove the, the obsession, the just, okay, let, can we go deeper? Can, um, what other sources can I tap? And, um, you know, to, to share it with fans is, is so fun. And, and to, when I find this stuff and just, oh man, people are going to eat this up (laughs) and, and designing it. And, um, I'm, I'm so grateful to, to hear that. Um, that's, as I said, was my goal. And, um, you know, when, when I look through books, you know, I, I, I want pictures I've never seen detail I've never heard. And, um, that's what I set out to do. Beautiful. And you did very well. One of the things that that went through my mind as I, when I looked through your books is it's almost like a a school textbook, but cool, you know? (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. That's, I, I remember, um, one of, one of the, the James Bond radios episodes after mine and, and you had just gotten the majesty's book and, and you mentioned that and, um, that really touches my heart. I have, I have had other people say it's like film school in a book and, um, that's, 
that um and what's what's really odd um Amazon at certain points will um set my majesty's book as a textbook in their textbook program. Wow. And I'm like, so is is there some, you know, film school or some is somebody using it as a textbook? You know, I that would I would love that. Mm. Um but um it's just it's strange that at certain points of the year they will they will um flip it over to to the textbook program. Interesting. If if I'd yeah. have, if I'd have been studying on a Majesty's Secret Service at school, I think my grades would have been way different and my whole school experience <laughs> would have been way improved. But uh, one can dream, one can dream. So uh, uh, imagine that yeah. a, a school or a college dedicated to Bond. That'd be that would that is the dream right there, isn't right it? Right there, absolutely. So Charles, we we wanted to follow up with you for 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 a couple of reasons. Firstly, obviously, you know, you, you, we, last time we spoke about the uh, Honor Majesty Secret Service and and the book you wrote, which was great. And obviously, we're talking about Living Daylights on the podcast at the moment. So you know, you were the perfect second guest. But there was a question we asked you uh, last time, which was uh, what what sort of Bond location have you not been to that you'd love to visit and we just wonder whether you actually <laughs> managed it which uh, if i remember correctly you I, I have not I, i'm you know that's, that's still on the to-do list but um <laughs> R- rosamond hasn't hasn't gotten in contact so uh, <laughs> oh, she, she she's a busy woman she's a busy woman but the, the call will come the call will come charles i'm sure of it <laughs> i'm waiting <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously you answered all of our sort of quick fire questions last time in terms of favorite book, film, actor, and we're assuming those haven't changed um, since last Correct. time, or maybe they have, but I, um, I doubt for it. Would they all sort of be the same? <laughs> Correct. Yes. Yes. I, uh, yes. I haven't had a change of heart of, of anything. But... No, Your Majesty's isn't like your worst film now or anything like that. <laughs> Just uh, dropped off. <laughs> <laughs> cool stuff. Never, never say never um, again and uh, die another day just screaming up the charts yeah, there just, yeah man, it happens it happens <laughs> so <laughs> true true that's and and you know you guys have have touched on this too that that a lot of times it depends on your mood that you know if you know obviously i think a lot of people will be rediscovering roger moore after all the coverage and um it's something that's that's kind of a shame that it takes his death to to have his era reevaluated but um you know if if i'm in a in a goofy mood i'll i'll throw on you know Moonraker or Octopussy or whatever and enjoy it and you know but if I'm looking for a Cold War thriller that's not really gonna gonna satisfy but um you know so I I think a lot of of the top 10 lists and and just you know that sort of things it, it depends on when you ask and what your mood is 100 percent, yeah without a doubt absolutely um, so you mentioned um in in our last interview basically that obviously majesties was your favorite film but the film that took you from bond fan into being a super fan was the living daylights um similarly with golden eye with tom now was that the main choice that you chose to do daylight daylights as a follow-up to majesties Pretty much. I, you know, I, I figured this question might come up, but, you know, there were a few, even in Amazon reviews, people were like, I have no idea why he chose Daylights. <laughs> you know? um, really? But yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, why did I need your permission to throw a book I'm going to do <laughs> yeah. next? You know, that's, um, but um it, it, yeah, it, it is. It is the film that that I just you know I I love with, I, you know I I sometimes joke with other fans that that Majesties is my wife, but Daylights is my mistress. You know <laughs> that it, um, <laughs> nice. it, it, it's it's um, you know I I just it, it, it did flip the switch um, and it's just such a great film and and the other thing and and other people have touched on this is that kind of like majesties it's it's not as as well known as well loved in the non-fan community you know that um i've had some people that were grateful that i chose something you know that uh, yes fans adore it 
But if you go up to the average man on the street and ask about the living daylights, they'll have no idea what you're talking about. Interesting. So yeah, unfortunately, I, I tell you what, what's what's intriguing about talking about this film for us and for our listeners as well. We, we've actually got some listener questions coming for you today as well, actually, which will be interesting. We'll get onto a okay. little bit later. But I've I've personally seen a lot of like if you get into the murky world of Bond forums on the internet, you 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 tend to get a lot of uh, sort of uh, abrasive kind of conversation. Where where people swear they've heard this story and they swear they've heard that story and and there's no sort of middle ground. Um, so one of the one of the questions I've had on, I've seen floating around on the forums and, and our uh, our blogmaster for JBR Jack Lugo also wanted to wanted to know as well um, is who was the first choice for Bond in the Living Daylights? Was it indeed Timothy Dalton? Because I've heard the story that it was Timmy was the first choice, but he was already committed to something else and couldn't do it. So they then went with Brosnan, who then obviously couldn't do it because of everything to still. And then when they went back to Tim, he was then available and then took it over. Others say Brosnan was the first choice, but because of the Remington Steel thing, Tim was the second choice. So what what is the real story behind that? Um, I, I think that it, it depends on, you know, what you say as, as first choice. That, you know, was Brosnan, uh, was Dalton approached before Brosnan? Then, then I'd say absolutely yes. Mm. Was, you know, were they prepared to offer him the film and you know, hear Tim sign on the dotted line. I I think that's that's a step too far. Mm-hmm. Um, that because of his commitments, um, you know, he he was he was doing films, TV, stage. Um, he had a very busy schedule. That it just it wasn't really working out. But I mean, they they were aware of of Dalton. Dalton was on the radar. Um, you know, Brosnan was was committed to um, Remington Steel, so there. Um, you know, I can I can totally see that Dalton was on the radar first. Mm-hmm. But um, as to who you know was offered the contract first, I I would say that that it was Brosnan. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Because yeah. I, I saw some some footage of, of an interview with Cubby around the time, like doing press for for Living Daylights, and they were kind of asking him that question of like, you know, we heard Brosnan had the role, and then he's dropped out. So, you know, what's what's the deal with him? And and Cubby's answer was sort of very sort of uh, a guarded response, which was, oh, oh no, we liked him. It, it was. Yeah. It, it, it it was, and that's you know, I've I've seen that interview as well, and. I've seen another where he's totally dismissive that he's like, we didn't want Brosnan at all. Mm. And and it's like, okay, so why are these, there's these photographs of you <laughs> yeah. and him signing the contract. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to, to deny that, that he was your man. Um, so, um, do you know if they actually shot anything with Pierce? Because obviously we've seen uh, the screen test with Pierce. We've seen him with uh, signing the contract. Did they actually get any anything in the can with him in any scene, or was that um, Remington Steel came in before any of that happened? Uh, the the Remington Steel came in before that. Um, uh, Brosnan has said that that he had uh, wardrobe tests and um, that there was. Some like they they started choosing stunt doubles based on you know his build and things like that. So it mm. was you know it, it was definitely close, but um, you know second unit was was Gibraltar and um, first unit was was um, the Blade and Safe House. So it, you know I, I haven't ever seen any shots of of Brosnan there. So um, no. I don't. I don't think that um, anything got filmed with him. Interesting. Mm. So other, I, other than the screen test, I remember mm. with uh, with Majesties. Obviously, you you, you had a, a personal friendship with Peter Hunt, and you you really sort of were allowed to go behind the curtain with a lot of things, and and it would you sort of discover the making of, of of that film. But what was sort of researching this particular book and this particular film? Like, what what kind of stuff did you did you dig up? Was it sort of readily available? Was it was it tough to kind of get any juicy details? What was the deal with that? Um, it was certainly a little easier. Um, you know, I, I did have access to John Glenn. Um, the, that is one thing that, that people kind of note between the two books is like, well, you know, Majesty seems a little deeper. And, you know, it's like, well, by Daylights, 
the the John Glenn Bond machine was well oiled. I mean, you know, when when I was going through Maybaum's archive and, and stuff like that, it just it struck me looking at the the production schedules and things like that, just how similar it was for for all of of John Glenn's films that there were start dates, you know, around the same dot time. There were premiere dates around the same time. It was um, it was phenomenal. I mean, I I just my hat is off to him how how well he um, was able to get you know the every James Bond film of the eighties done on time, you know, on budget. Um, and even with the insanity of replacing Dalton, you know, and for Pierce at the last moment, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I point out to people is that, um, Timothy had the least, um, preparation time of any of the bonds, um, that, you know, he, he went straight from Brenda Starr, um, to, to daylights with, with no break and, um, I mean, that was, I, I just can't imagine being the director in that situation and, you know, being like, okay, we just lost the star. What do we do now? Um, and, and yet, again, um, with Glenn's unflappability and, and, um, just, um, <sighs> cranked it out um so to answer your question um you know uh, the the scripts are was obviously the the gold mine with the young bond stuff and um the thing that that kind of tickled me when skyfall came out and there's the ancestral home and you know although it wasn't called skyfall that the the first sort of ancestral castle stuff is in the early daylight scripts interesting yeah. that's I, for me that is the most intriguing part of of the sort of history of bond is those early scripts where you know things that never happened or, or angles that they were playing that they were kind of toying with going down those routes and you kind of see that written down there on the paper i think is is really intriguing so for, for those that haven't sort of read the book or anything like that let's, let's expand on that a little bit then so there was there was going to be that sort of skyfall angle within the living daylights itself well, um, the in the right after the premiere of of Udo Kill, um, Maybaum gets hired to to do another script uh, for the next film, um, along with Michael D. Wilson, and they they decide immediately at that point that that Roger's done. Um, you know that they will be having a new actor for the next film. Um, that's that's something that I in the script chapter, I'm like, despite what you've heard, you know, the living daylights was not written for Roger Moore. You know, that's, that's 100% fact. And, and, you know, any, any sort of perusal of Maybaum's archive will show that fact. Um, but so they decide to have, um, Bond be very young and he's a 20 year old Lieutenant, you know, in, in the Royal Navy. And, um, He's he's very brash. He's making mistakes. He's um, getting into trouble, and he finally he he gets jailed. And um, his grandfather says, "You know, you need to get your act together." And um, Bond visits him at the ancestral castle. And uh, the grandfather explains this amazing naval tradition that uh, the Bonds have had that, you know, they they fought at Trafalgar and they fought at Jutland and um, that it's up to Bond to continue that legacy. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to put you in touch with um, someone that used to date your aunt um, Charmaine. <laughs> and that turns out to be him. Wow. Uh, that- yeah, just imagine yeah, yeah. if that. So, had, yeah. That's crazy. If, if they had gone ahead head with around something that, like that, that's, that's, yeah. that's yeah. really kind of incestuous and weird, you yeah. know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, it brings I'll a whole new thing you, to little, M, little, M being little, his mother. <laughs> I know, little little Jimmy Bond. I remember you know, <laughs> seeing yeah, you as a child. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 really freaky. 
Um, That's one of those things, though, I guess. It's like there's a history with Bond, isn't there, where you see little seeds of an idea that they came up with at some point turning up in a later movie. And I suppose that obviously they've done the, 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 the Bond reboot with Casino Royale, sort of like the, the origins of Bond a little bit with that. But it is intriguing to think whether whether they might revisit that super young Bond, like brash youngster kind of idea in the future at some point. Yeah. And it's also interesting from the point of view that you do hear a lot of people sort of say that, um, you know, they came up with the, for instance, Quentin Tarantino, you know, his idea was to bring Bond back to, to doing sort of Casino Royale and stuff like that. But whereas they all already had ideas of bringing Bond back younger, way before any of that happened. Um, way exactly. before he was sort of exactly. talking about it, so I think Eon have, have, have you know considered every sort of variation that anyone can think of Definitely. to do with Bond throughout throughout time so far. I agree, and you know that's as you can read in my book that that Cubby, you know, he doesn't immediately squash this idea, but as it gets further and further along, he he finally makes the decision that no, people don't want to see a Bond, you know, a young Bond making mistakes. They they want to see the professional um, that they've come to know and love. Absolutely. Yeah. So I suppose what's interesting about this sort of like junction in, in Bond history is you had, you know, a super well-loved Bond like Roger, um, you know, very, very long tenure. And, you know, of course, by, by the time Roger sort of hangs up his PPK, it's kind of like, it's, it's time to freshen things up a bit. Absolutely. You know, and take things in a new direction. So what was the, the sort of the, the, the ideas at the time, obviously after they'd made that decision that they weren't going to go young, Bond, they were going to just sort of reintroduce the, the fully formed Bond with a, with a new actor. Obviously, there's a real sort of feel of going back to the Fleming original and stuff. And Timothy's been very sort of outspoken about reading the books and keeping it as close to that as possible. So where, where did that sort of that idea come from? Because there was obviously a little bit of that, well, a lot of that really in Fear Eyes Only a few films back, but we get it again here. So who was the driving force behind sort of taking things back to the basics? Um, I think it was Maybaum. Um I, I I agree that it you know, the the Fleming um was was something that was needed, you know, not that, that Roger was, was anti Fleming, but um uh, that's you know, in, in the scripts there there are definitely um Fleming bits um and I um really loved uh from your previous podcast where you were um reading the Fleming and comparing it to the um finished film mm. and just how much was used. Mm. And um I have a little bit of trivia here for you with, with my book that if if you look at the cover of the Making of Living Daylights, uh, you'll see that, that Timothy's foot is uh on the left there at the bottom, almost on the edge, and that's my little attempt at acknowledging that this is Fleming's Bond. He's he's literally <laughs> stepping off the page. <laughs> oh, I like it. Nice. That's, I like that. that's great. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um, there's a, another sort of fascinating thing that you go into in the book is about sort of scenes that obviously don't end up in the film. We mentioned the sort of story there with the, with the potentially young Bond. One of the most famous ones that people are aware of is a magic carpet ride. We've seen that sort of video. And you know, the idea was interesting, but it, it it didn't quite work, did it, in terms of it being sort of a bit slow and everything like that. Um, but that whole scene was going to be extended quite a bit, wasn't there? Because there was a bit where Bond ended up with a gorilla, which I remember you mentioning last time was sort of another Maybarm passion. He just loved gorillas, didn't he? Um, it's crazy. Can you tell us a bit about that one? It, it sounds it sounds yeah, like mad. Um, it, it was it was uh, it was scripted. It was storyboarded. Um... And so, you know, he escapes from the rooftop um, on the magic carpet, and um, when he gets to another building, um, there's a grill, and he kind of scrambles down inside, and then he's in a gorilla cage. And um, the gorilla takes a liking to Bond. I mean, not sexually, thank you, thankfully, but, um, <laughs> you know, does... <laughs> Does you know is is not you know and and in that sense it's like okay I can I can see a, a Roger and a gorilla getting along I can't see Tim and a gorilla getting absolutely along. <laughs> um, but but then you know the the policeman 
chase him and, and one of them falls in and the gorilla really hates the policeman and, and rips off a toupee, you know, so that, that again, that, that screams Roger Moore era rather than, than Tim. Yeah. Um, um. And there's also a baby gorilla and, you know, Bond has to hand someone off that baby gorilla and is like, I think he needs changing. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it does not belong in the living daylights. You yeah. know, I mean, it, no. it is, is amusing to look at and, and, you know, I just scratch my head and, and like you said, it's, it was, it was Maybaum's fascination and obsession trying so, to get, uh, the gorillas and the monkeys and and all that and um, I'm very grateful that it was never filmed. <laughs> I mean, it just, any uh, any any possibility that it might turn up in Bond Twenty Five? What do we think? <laughs> 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 no, Barbara maybe hasn't not. called and asked for the uh, for the um, storyboards back. So oh, she hasn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So when I, I remember there were, there were quite a few scenes in in Majesties that obviously didn't make the cut and stuff, and there were some some quite weird things in some of the early drafts as well. Like I remember when Bond is escaping from Peace Glory or something, there was a monkey scene with that one, wasn't it, where the monkey helped him pick the lock of the cage that he was in, or something along those lines. Um, Correct. Were there any any sort of what what would you say researching sort of early versions of Living Daylights and things like that? What would you, was there anything that really stood out as kind of shocking aside from the obviously the gorilla scene we just talked about in the magic carpet? Were there any kind of sort of angles or stories or scenes that were, were kind of outstanding in some way to you as you were researching? Um, I think the the thing that I had a little trouble wrapping my head around and and was surprised about is that in the um, early, early drafts, uh, James Bond is not the first 007. Um, that there's an older agent, um, named Burton Trevor and, um, Maybaum even sort of acknowledges immediately within the script that, oh, by the way, that's for Richard Burton and Trevor Howard. Right. Um, so that was kind of who he was that that type is who he was picturing, you know, an older statesman mm-hmm. um, agent that kind of, you know, passes along the torch to James Bond. And um, that that just that really struck me as, wow, I, I you know, um, and especially in a transition film that I mean, w- would you would you cast Roger? Would you? you know, cast someone, I mean, that's, that's not mentioned at all. And, and again, and again, Cubby nixed the idea of, of young Bond, but, um, it would just be weird that you'd have two 007s in the movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, I, um, yeah, I, I, th- I think I think the idea of having the set of double O numbers and one of them is murdered and then someone else comes in and takes over that prefix, that code, that makes sense. I think that's fine. Double O nine murdered an octopusy, another double O nine goes after Renard in the world is not enough. I think that's okay. But having two double O sevens and one handing over to the other, that seems almost like sixty seven Casino Royale in a in a way. It's uh, <laughs> heading towards that territory strange you know what yeah I'd, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd be i'd be fine with the, all the other double o's for sure like having multiple double o eight suit like you say either gets killed and then replaced or whatever but there's something about the double o seven i feel like nobody else is allowed that i think no matter who it is i, I feel that's weird i agree yeah. that's 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 why it, it struck me as you know this this i don't think would work no, it's crazy. Um, so, Charles, looking at the filming of Mag- of uh, Daylights itself, were there any onset stories of Tim? Um, what he was like to work with? We we heard that he was, you know, he's strangely or surprisingly quite nervous at times, and he really wanted to check the rushes um, on a, on a regular basis just to make sure he was sort of hitting his mark and doing everything right. Do you do you know what that sort of side of things was like, and what the relationship between Tim and John Glenn was like as well? Um, yeah, um, I've, I've heard nothing but, but positive stories. Um, the, uh, I think it, it shows his commitment to the craft that, that he wanted to do this right, that it was, you know, obviously not just a paycheck. He, um, he knew the fan base was so massive and that it, it wasn't really in his wheelhouse. I mean, he had, he had done, 
um, you know, Flash Gordon and, and stuff like that. But, um, you know, he hadn't done a film of this scope um, before. Um, I know that that Glenn was was not happy. I mean, there's the story he tells about how some secretary, um, you know, was watching the rushes with the group and she didn't like the way Timothy was kissing. And hmm. you know, so Glenn just suddenly dropped the number of people that could watch the, watch the rushes. It's just like, okay, if everyone has an opinion here, and you know, you're you're going to make my star nervous because you personally don't like the way he kisses Miriam Diabo. Um, hmm. You know, that's that's going to turn into into madness. Um, I know that, like when they were filming um, the fake killing of Pushkin. Um, at that location that, um, there was a pub nearby and, you know, Tim went and bought everyone drinks and, you know, so I, I think that, um, he is a very private person, um, but, but very amiable and everyone I've talked to both in front of and, and behind the camera, um, has, has nothing but praise for him. Um, kind of a funny story with, uh, Thomas Wheatley, um, he, when I met him and interviewed him for the book, um, I said, man, that, that sniper scene is, is really intense. And, you know, he's very British. He's like, was it? <laughs> like, <laughs> were you there? <laughs> um, that, that I, I just, I, you know, it's, it's so British to answer a question with another question. And, you know, oh, that's a bit of luck being built out like that, isn't it? Um, and, you know, I, I just sort of contrast it with an American who probably would, you know, puff up his chest and say, well, you know, Tim and, and Glenn, John Glenn really wanted to film it for laughs. But, uh, oh. you know, I, I really want to make sure that it was it was serious. <laughs> you know? so, here's a question then. Is Thomas Wheatley as grumpy as he is on film, on film as Saunders? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> and um, he's. He's he's very nice. I'm I'm bummed that uh, I I wasn't one of the first people to interview him because another fan, and this was many years ago, but another fan um, interviewed him and Wheatley gave him one of the suits that was used in the film. Oh, no way! No way, oh, dude! I know, I know. I'm like, man, that's that's a missed opportunity. Right. Um, yeah. But I I do have some wardrobe uh, from the film, which I'm uh, just Ooh. just so blown away that I that I own. Um, I, I got it from Colin Thurston, the uh, the property store master. Um, yeah. The black assault suit from uh, the boat. Oh, and, that is the uh, yes, number and, one <laughs> uniform you could ask for. Exactly, so exactly. Cool. Uh, of you know, of of all the things from that film that I would have wanted, that oh, that man. was number one. And um, he told me that um, with the filming in Gibraltar, that they they set aside the the best suit that had survived. You know, the others had had paintball on them and things like that. And <sighs> and one of those went up for auction. Um, not too long after filming completed um, at a bottoms auction, um, I was at the University of St. Andrews at the time. Obviously, I had no nowhere near enough money to bid on it. But um, so I, I got I got that, and you know he he gave me some also some Polaroids from um, filming, and um, I, I just I. I can't wrap my head around the fact that I own that. And, um, you know, I, I will ask that when you guys show that in the credit sequence, you will have to put a little arrow that says property of Charles Hoffenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. Do, so, we have to um, ask Charles. Oh, go on, Tom. You're, you're about to ask him exactly what I'm about to ask him because I know that you do exactly what I do if I had it. Go on, Tom, you ask him. How many times have you put it on and looked at yourself in the mirror, Charles? <laughs> Only a couple. <laughs> Come on. Uh, <laughs> you want me to say, I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> you see, if that was mine, I would be wearing it most weekends and I would be just jumping on top of random cars outside my house and uh, making a fool of myself. But it's, oh, dude, that's that's incredible. Absolutely. Missing out on a, on a Saunders suit, I think, is, is, is a shame. But to own that suit, dude, is, is pretty outrageous. 
Yeah, it is. Right. It's um, uh, Tiny Nichols, the uh, the costume um, supervisor, picked them. And, and when I talked with John Glenn about it, he's like, yeah, that, that suit is, is just, it's so masculine. Mm. Um, and um, he said that, that Tiny um, had a lot of parachuting experience and, you know, that's, he was, he was perfect for, nice. for getting the costumes did, for that. Um, did it come the, with the, the other thing that I have stuff. is, is one of um, the leather jackets that, that Tim wore. Is that um, from the uh, Vienna scenes? Correct. Absolutely. Very yes. nice. Sorry, Chris, you so had a question the, there that dropped Yeah, out sorry. Um, so the, the assault uniform there, Charles, did that come with the metal rings over the shoulders? Unfortunately not. Um, the, the parachute stuff is separate, um, but um, I'm, I'm looking to, to find, you know, at least recreations of that to, to give <laughs> yeah. the full effect. Sweet. Amazing. So um, – I guess there's a looking back. There's a there's a sort of a perception, isn't there? Even again, comparing it to Majesties, that Majesties was perhaps a bit of a flop because you know it didn't reach the same success that Sean's films had had, had reached and all that kind of stuff. And I feel there's like a, a similar sort of thing with with Tim's two films that that they're sort of you know not as any. I guess you said it yourself at the beginning of the interview. Not as widely regarded amongst the wider world, loved by the fans, but not so much by the world wider world. What, what was the reception of the film like when it came out? What was was that like um there was a lot of pre-publicity um on the fact that he only has one bond girl and you know we we obviously assume that he sleeps with uh kel tyler bell avery she she changed the the girl on the boat changed her name yeah. during the middle of filming and it was it was bizarre i even saw <laughs> the production memo where they're like you know yeah she's going to be known as this name now i'm like okay um <laughs> but anyway um there was a ton of publicity about oh well you know this is the era of aids and he's only going to have one girl and so um i mean it, it wasn't like the knives were out for when Lazenby quit, but it was strange to sort of, you know, that there was almost a, a negativity about the transition before he even got started. I mean, it, you know, again, it wasn't, it wasn't directed at Tim, but it was sort of, Oh, well, this new bond only has one woman because of AIDS and, mm. and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, Glenn, um, addressed it once. He's like, well, you know, people are dying and, you know, I, I, it's, um, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I, I can't blame Daylight's box office numbers on, on that, but I just thought it was interesting that, you know, um, here they were sort of focusing on that aspect, yeah. um, before Timothy, you know, even said a word. Um, but, uh, like like you said earlier, you know Roger Moore was so loved, and and you know I I include myself in that group, and um, I, I think that just as as Roger said about Lazenby, that you know he was the first to take over from an incredibly popular actor, and and almost paved the way for Roger to do it again, mm. and so you know I I think that that Tim had incredible shoes to fill, and that the audience wasn't quite ready that I, that's the other funny thing. Like you mentioned with bond forums that I see a lot of people now who grew up in the Daniel Craig era and they're going back and rediscovering the earlier films. And they're like, well, Timothy Dalton was the Daniel Craig of his era. Mm. And I'm mm. like, do you realize how history works? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 1987 is before 2006. It's kind of, um, you know, um, so that's my, my personal belief is that, that it was, and, and I mentioned this in my introduction to the Daylights book, that, that Dalton was a shock to the system, you know, for, for a lot of people that it was like, and, and too, and, and you guys touched on this in your review, um, in the two part review that daylights is a complicated film. And, and John Cork jokes about that too, that, you know, he's like, try to explain the living daylights in a single sentence. Mm -hmm. You can't, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's, it's too complex. And 
um, for for people that want a popcorn fun, don't have to think for two hours. Um, you know, that's that that was not you know their cup of tea, and and I know as a seventeen year old seeing it in the theater for the first time, I was confused. You know, I was like, what what's going on? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that that my second viewing, I was like, oh okay, you know this this makes sense, but. Um, you know, there were parts of it that, uh, like you mentioned with him pulling the bullets out, you know, yes, I I know that, okay, those are blanks, but I think, you know, probably 90% of the audience didn't understand. It's like, those are bullets, Mm. you know, that, um, so, um, and, you know, I, I, I love Jerome Crabbe and, and, um, Joe Don Baker, but they're not strong villains. And Miriam Diabo is, is a sweet actress, but I mean, I don't think anyone would put her at the top of, of the Bond girls list. I mean, you know, and it's, um, but, but she played, she played the part well, and it was, it was a naive character and, um, that worked for the film, you know, that, mm. that was the goal that it wasn't, Oh, she's a super agent that can kick Bond's ass. You know, that yeah. <laughs> obviously the, it was quite the opposite. So I, I think that that works, but, but again, when, when you sort of separate the individual elements of daylights, there, there are some serious weaknesses. And, um, you know, I, I think, Dalton's performance is, you know, just pulls everything up so high. And um, there are also obviously a lot of positives. Absolutely. So touching on, on Tim pulling everything up then, what, what is your, you're obviously well known as the world's number one George Lazenby fan, but um, what, what is your opinion of, of Tim as Bond then? Um, I love it. I, I think he's the closest to Fleming. Um, I, you know, I love your description of his wolfish eyes. Um, I also really like his voice. I think that it's kind of, uh, I've described as like steel wrapped in silk that it, um, Hmm. I, I would tap him as, as the, um, the premier bond voice, um, especially when he's mad. (laughs) (laughs) Um, the like you've said the the one liners you know he he definitely begrudgingly says them i mean it it um that's his downfall um and you know i mean he he performs them he does the eye rolls he um he executes them but you can tell he he'd rather be saying something else <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> Um, but I think that, um, you know, just when, when you put him in a tuxedo or or the black assault suit that, you know, that's, that's what James Bond looks like to me. So Um, do you think that, that, the, how do you think the public sort of reacted to him at the time? Because again, I remember back in the day uh, and Daylights was the very first one I saw at the cinema and I I have the vaguest memory of, of seeing the pre-title sequence. But I remember back in the day when you, when James Bond came up, there was very, it was like a Beatles versus Rolling Stones thing. It was, it felt like half the world was Sean people and half the world were Roger people people and and you were either one or the other so what for for a new bond with a new film a new sort of era what was the the public reaction to to timothy as bond um i think there was caution there was sort of you know he he wasn't well known the way roger was um he did the publicity tours but but he was not super comfortable doing them um both he and Miriam have said that, um, you know, publicizing the film was harder than making the film. I mean, those, Mm. those publicity junkets across multiple countries, multiple continents, you're in hotel rooms, things like that. So, um, I think that, that, that was very different that, that again, Tim, Tim was willing to promote the film, but not to the extent that Roger was that, you know, Roger was a brand ambassador, um, that I doubt we'll ever see again, you know, that, that he was just so uh, loved, loved the job, loved promoting the films. And, um, you know, again, Tim would do the publicity junkets. Um, but, um, you know, it, it was not his favorite thing. Mm. And, um, he made that kind of obvious. So, 
um, getting back to your original question about how the public perceived him, uh, you know, again, they, they were so used to Roger. Um, this, this new guy was, was very private. Um, and it sort of, um, then became a vicious cycle that because of his desire for privacy, they wanted that much more from him. And, um, you know, he made it very clear that I don't drive an Aston Martin. I drive a Toyota. <laughs> um, I'd rather be, I'd rather be fishing. Um, and you know, he'd had some, some romances and, and things like that. And they were going after that and that really pissed him off. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so, um, in that sense, he, he was not the perfect candidate to, to fill the role from a publicity standpoint that it was someone that was, that was guarded. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't know, had he been the, the Brosnan, you know, more, more affable, um, in the interviews and, and stuff like that. And, and that's, you know, what I love about the Timothy interviews is, is just how much of a student of the character he was that, you know, I mean, he could talk about from Russia with love and majesties and stuff like that. And, and not just the films, but the books and, and really got to the heart of, of Fleming's character. And when you're talking to a newspaper person whose knowledge of bond, you know, is, yeah, they've seen a few Roger films. You know, hmm. it was, I think, kind of wasted on them. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's a very good point. And also, I think that could subsequently have a negative effect from from in terms of the journalist if they're not getting the feedback they want from, from someone like Tim, Timothy. Exactly. That, that I, can, I yeah. agree 100%. Yeah, and I, I think that's probably why um, some of the sort of results or, or critiques and reviews maybe possibly ended up the way they did. But in terms of box office itself, then it was it definitely wasn't a failure, was it? It was correct, correct. It was it was in the top ten for the year, um, and um, you know, obviously successful yeah. enough to to make another one. And um, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've I've got a, a, an interesting question here, Charles. So, in a completely alternate dimension, had Piers Brosnan taken over the role for Daylights, how different do you think the film would be, and do you think his approach to Bond would have been different, or still along the sort of grittier edge that that Dalton brought? Um, I I think it would have been a little more. Uh, on the meter towards Roger, um, especially at that age, you know, and, and Pierce has talked about that he's glad that he had that, that break and that, you know, golden eye came at the right time and, and things like that, that he had lived more. Um, so I, you know, I, um, I think it, it would have been successful, um, it, it wouldn't have been the shock to the system. Um, you know, would they have kept the magic carpet in there? Had, had Brosnan been there? I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I think it, it would have been a, a little more humorous, but I, that's, that's a good question as far as, you know, would, would the grittiness, would the, um, would the anger that, that Dalton brought, um, would Brosnan have matched that? Would they have ignored that? Um, it's it's very tough to say, um, but I you know I I wouldn't give up Dalton for anything. So absolutely interesting. Okay, so we've got some uh, some JBR listener questions. We we put the call out to the Facebook page uh, for for questions for you. Um, so let's switch okay. switch it over to some of the lessons. Uh, the first one we got is from uh, JBR listener Julian O'Hare, who says, "I would like to know if there was any possibility that another director was going to be considered for the Living Daylights, seeing as A View to a Kill was met with a mixed critical reception. Personally, I'm glad John Glenn did direct it, as he's a very underrated director. Also, were any other actors considered for the roles of Koskoff and Whitaker? Um, the I think no, no for all three. Um, that that uh, Glenn, you know, had an incredible relationship with the Broccoli's, and um, again, like I was saying, with with him, 
um, just being such a, a great, um, you know, motivator and, um, you know, manager of, of the chaos that a Bond film is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think they, they had no reason to, to change, uh, captains of that ship. Um, the, um, for, for Koskov, um, they had seen, um, Jerome Crabbe in Soldier of Orange. That's, um, which is a, a very good story of, um, the Dutch in World War II. And, um, they just loved his performance. What, what I mentioned in the book, um, that I thought was fascinating when I started going through his back biography and, um, looking at some of his work, um, was that he had starred in a film where he plays a Russian KGB guy that is going to start World War III by using a hmm. scouring pig that has a nuclear bomb in it. Interesting. <laughs> exactly. I know. I know. So I wonder, you know, when, when he had to get in, in the pig for, the, for day, like, <laughs> this again? <laughs> <laughs> he was great, Hugh and Crevet. So he much was. fun in the role. He, that, he's brilliant. I mean, he, he's, he's such a you know he's so likable i mean that's that's part of the problem that yeah. you know I, I know both of you have said that you know it's it's a problem with daylights that the villains aren't really you know threatening and um you know koskov is is just so likable i mean yes he's a scoundrel and and all that but but he has such a smile on his face and um i did see one review that that I uh, amused me that called them the Laurel and Hardy of. <laughs> <laughs> it's not far wrong. Well, that's a good call, actually. Yeah. 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 Um, um, and as, as far as uh, Whitaker, um, I know that, that Barbara had long admired uh, Joe Don Baker's work. Um, and um, what's interesting too um, is that um now I'm forgetting the name of it, but um, he had worked with Martin Campbell first um, in in the TV uh, series. Oh, what was it called? That was exactly. Escape from Darkness, was it? Yes, yes, yes. That she had seen him in that and and just was blown away by his performance, and so that's why they wanted him for Daylights. And how ironic that years later, you know, Campbell would would become um, the next Bond director oh. and yeah. and bring along Joe Don Baker. I mean, it's just it it shows you know just how how such a, a tight family they all are. That was it. Yeah, the Edge of Darkness. I think that was called. I remember Edge watching Darkness, that yeah. and um, the Edge of Darkness, and that was great. And in fact, they made a remake of it. I think was it with Mel Gibson or something like that. Correct. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, which, which which obviously wasn't as good as a TV series, but still interesting nevertheless. Um, but definitely worth a watch, I think. Um, so for our next listener question, in fact, we've had a couple of people ask this one, Steve Spring and Jack McMorrow. Basically, how much did the script change, if at all, going from Brosnan to Dalton? Um, were there any early versions that... What, 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 I think you mentioned that the, the, the timing from Brosnan to Dalton was so short... If Correct. if Brosnan had had taken on the role, would that script have been exactly the same as the one given to Dalton when he started? Correct. I, I'm I'm fairly confident that it that it would. Um, the the only um, late script changes um, came, and and again, this is this is pre Dalton, but but still late as far as the timeline. Um, was Gibraltar was not in the picture until later. Um, that was something that um, John Glenn suggested. Um, and so in Maybaum's archives, there are some um, paper clips of, okay, you know, instead of this happening in Vienna, we're actually going to have it happen in, um, in Gibraltar. So, um, and that's, you know, I, I know that I'm, I'm very grateful that, that you both rank the, the Daylights pre-title as, you know, number one or tied with number one. I mean, I, I just brilliant. I cannot believe how phenomenal it is. Hmm. It, it blows my mind. And, um, you guys talked about too, that, that shot where the three double O's come out of, of the C-130 
And so nice. I, I was I, I was so grateful to get in contact um, with the guy that filmed that. And um, you know, I I tracked him down. He's in Hawaii, um, Tom Sanders, and um, asked if he had any stuff from from the film, and and he did, and. Um, you know, his prices were pretty high and, and I was like, okay. And then I'm like, well, he literally risked his life for this stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Um, because the, the camera and he had multiple cameras on his head. He had a, a film, um, camera and then also a stills camera and, um, it added like, you know, 20 pounds or something. So it was, it was, you know, skydiving is dangerous, but to do it with, this thing that could snap your neck mm. um it was um but i'm i'm very proud of those shots in the book it's um they're, they're just so gorgeous i thought and, you were going to ask and, him if if you could reenact it charles because now you've obviously got your assault <laughs> suit yourself <laughs> very nice cool next question comes in from jbr listener richard knox uh, he's got a couple of questions actually he says uh, I wanted to know a bit more about Lewis Collins. Did he screen test for the role? We've all seen the Sam Neill screen test, but not many others. And how close did Sam come to nabbing the role? He's got more to come. So let's let's start with that's, that part. Yeah, that's actually Julian's okay. question. Sorry, Tom. Oh, is it? Have I got it the wrong way around? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, Lewis Collins was was a front runner. Um, I, I I don't my my understanding is that that he did not test but uh, they had the professionals i mean it was kind of like a roger moore thing where okay do we really need to test this guy we can watch 50 episodes where he's kicking butt and shooting people um the problem was that he was way too brash and um he basically flubbed the interview with gubby um (laughs) there's some speculation that um I know there's one Bond candidate that, um, when meeting Cubby, uh, sort of alluded to the fact that maybe he was a gangster and said, oh, so you're the godfather around here, and that Cubby was immediately turned off. Um, I, I don't know if that was Collins or not, um, but I know that that Collins basically torpedoed at his own chances, that he was way too cocky and apparently was, you know, making some demands, um, before he even had the role. And, um, they just, they, they didn't want to deal with that. Um, I wonder, I, I, yeah, I, I wonder if he, he, he would have been good. Playing up. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I, I really enjoy his performance in, in The Professionals. I think he's he's awesome. He's a good actor. Um, kind of had his Bond film light uh, era with uh, Who Dares Wins. Um, you know, they gave him the lead in that, and that's filmed at Pinewood. Um, but um, as far as Sam Neill, he, he was apparently incredibly close, that, that both Barbara and Michael were really championing him, and, and Cubby put the brakes on. I mean, but... You know, as you said, we've we've seen his test. Um, it it didn't do a lot for me. I mean, he's he's a great actor, but he doesn't seem like Bond to me. Yeah, absolutely. No. Well, how 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 come we get to see Samuel screen test? Because usually those things are kept pretty tightly under wraps, isn't it? Because in a, in a sense, it's perceived that it's a bit of a dig at the actor themselves because it's something they didn't get the job for and stuff like that. True, true. And and there were there were some wild rumors i don't know if you remember when this happened but um the the daylights dvd went out of print compared to the others um a few years ago and um the the whole internet forums went wild with speculation that oh well sam neil you know didn't like the fact that his screen test was on there and that's why it was withdrawn mm. and you know that that was a complete fabrication and and john cork had to step in you know as the producer of the dvds he he's like no that's not the reason it was you know some mgm snafu um but he he points out that all the stuff that appears on the on the dvds you know they have to get they have to get sign-offs from everybody. So, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> Sam Neill had to say, yes, you can use my screen test. And um, 
when I worked on the Majesty's DVD, that Diana Rigg would not sign off on anything. You know, it was very unfortunate that there, there was there was some stuff. There's a Lux soap commercial. Um, there's her. It's it's not a screen test. It's a makeup test um, that that they had for Majesties. And um, you know, she said, if if you're giving me the option to decline, then I'm declining. Um, That's a real shame, so, isn't it? Real it, shame. It's, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. I, you know, um, I'm grateful that I got to see the stuff, but, um, you know, and uh, they, they, MGM wants to, to, you know, have everybody be satisfied and not be blindsided and, oh my God. And, and like you said that, yeah, if, if there's a screen test and you didn't get it, then it's sort of, oh, look how bad this guy is. Um, you know, that's not the way we as Bond fans perceive it. We're mm. more, oh, my God, yeah. what if, you know, yeah. that, that yeah. we're eating it up. But, um, you know, you have to look at the flip side, like you said, of, OK, well, this is a potential for making fun of someone. And, you know, so MGM wants sign offs on absolutely everything. Mm. And um, so um, that's, you know, as, as to what survives and what doesn't and, you you know that I have no clue. I um, I know that there was a massive warehouse in Europe that um, did have um, a lot of the early Bond stuff, and they apparently tossed a, a lot of you know overage that you know just storage space was at a premium. And as everyone has to point out, in the eras before DVD, why would you keep this stuff? Yeah. You know, that, <laughs> yes. Me as a historian and as a rabid Bond fan is like, oh my God, I would you know give a body part for some of this stuff. Yeah. But um, you know, from a business standpoint, of why are we keeping this? I mean, it. it mm. I'm also you know for some of the things there just weren't that many of it. Um, the above it all featurette on the Majesty's DVD of of the filming with Johnny Jordan. MGM didn't have that. I mean, I, that came from my collection. So it, <laughs> it's just so bizarre that, um, you know, they they just they didn't keep stuff. Um, but this kind of beggars a different question then, Charles, because that is understandable and it's a real shame. And you think of how many screen tests out there, which, you know, we haven't seen. And that's that's, you know, that would be amazing if that opportunity ever came about. But you can understand that being back in the day, like you said, pre-digital, but yet you're looking at your, your Spectre, your Skyfall DVDs that come out, but yet they're still not giving us many extras. Um, <laughs> and, and, the, and the opportunity is there. Why Why do you think that is? I know it's slightly off topic here, but why do you think hmm. that is? Because that's that's a strange one for me. I, I agree. It, it's, it, it maddens me as well. And I think like so many things in life, it comes down to money that – um, will that Skyfall DVD sell, you know, X thousands more units if you throw on a screen test? Probably not. Yeah. You know, that, um, you know, when, when working with John Cork on the, the first set of, of DVDs that, um, the budgets are not that big, you know, they, mm. um, and, you know, so you're like, well, it's not going to cost anything to, it's already digitized and, and blah, blah, blah. But again, when you need sign offs, you need, um, to go through all this red tape. Um, and the, the companies that they release these, I mean, it's, to me, it's one of the downsides of streaming that, that extras, you know, you're not streaming extras when you're watching Netflix, you know, that you, you pull up the film and you watch the film, but if you want all the behind the scenes and the audio commentaries and the unused stuff and all that, that's, that's not part of the streaming package. And so it's, it's unfortunately where the industry is going and it, it's a tragedy. I, I'm, you know, it, I, I don't think it bodes well for the extras and stuff like that. And there will always be documentaries and, and things like that. But the full, you know, Monty that, that we all want of of every bits and pieces of footage that exists um, is is sadly not a reality. And, um, you know, I, I – um, it's it's something that's, that's you know, really too bad. But um, – 
one so of I, those I agree things, with you. It, it, it's it's very frustrating to you know that they've got to have these these tests, but um, and and other footage, but it's and when um, part of my collection was was filmed for the the DVDs and some of the people helping me film it, you know, they're like, Oh, are you going to get paid for this? And I'm like, no, I mean, they, you know, MGM did pay my expenses and things like that, but I had to explain to them as well that, you know, these DVDs are going to sell whether Charles Selfenstein's collection is on them or not. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Mm -hmm. that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I, I, again, the bottom line is it's a financial decision. Yeah. Shame. So I think I, I I guess when when they released with Casino Royale, wasn't it? They had a, a special edition, an ultimate edition, and then a deluxe edition, which had everything. And then once you get it once, you think that's that's what they're going to keep keep sort of feeding us with. Um, obviously that didn't happen, but there we go. Um, so Julian had a second part to his question as well, uh, which was, do you know if the alternate Dalton gun barrel was intended to be used but reshot, or was it just a placeholder? My understanding that it is a placeholder. Yeah, and what's your actual opinion on it? Because I've seen it a few times, um, and Tom, me, Tom, both Tom and I have seen it, and it almost looks like he's trying to recreate the old school Bob Simmons jump and shoot. Um, I very agree. different I to agree. the sort of polished article. Yeah, what did you think? Right, right. That's yeah. I, I, there are parts of me that like it, but it's it's a little too over dramatic. Um, but I, I do think it's cool. Um, and, and that, that does bring up the, the bootleg and, and I don't know how that hurt the box office. You know, I, I know mm-hmm. that, that Eon was, was very upset and, you know, that a, a partial work print got out and was, was making the, the VHS pirate, um, circle. And so they even created a poster that, you know, has the, the Dalton silhouette that, oh, that's not the real thing. Um, so I, I wouldn't doubt that, 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 you know, if, if someone had that, they, they wouldn't need to go to the cinema. So, no. um, did you happen to see that yourself at all or not? I, I, I have seen it. Um, there, there are some alternate takes, um, Dalton's, um, dialogue is, is a little rougher. So I, I think that, um, that was something that was, you know, obviously redubbed when um, th- they went in to to do the automated dialogue replacement that that films do, um, and you know, it, it, it a, a good chunk of the film is missing, so um, it's it's not a very satisfying experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like the uh, ABC cut of Majesties. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's it's you know it's a it's a pale copy of the original, and and you know with just so many things missing. Um, it it does have the better make that two line. Ah, um, there we go. With the uh, um, with Saunders' death. Um, oh, it does. And and you know they're. There are minor differences here and here or there. Um, <laughs> Video Watchdog uh, has an issue where they kind of detail the um, the differences between the the two versions. Interesting, cool. So Richard Knox's actual question, which I got them in the wrong order, was uh, Timothy Dalton is arguably the most Fleming-inspired Bond actor, portraying a more tarnished, cold-blooded killer with a sharp, dangerous edge. How much influence did Dalton's theatrical background have on the making of The Living Day Nights? And upon finishing the film, were there intentions to continue this heightened Fleming flavour in future Dalton Bond adventures? Um, I... Uh... I agree with his assessment that it's, you know, uh, Dalton is, is Fleming on film. Um, I I think that, um, Timothy's theatrical background, um, in some cases, um, and, and I think you guys mentioned this in, in your review, um, in some cases it's a little too evident that, um, you know, he, uh, I love his voice, but 
you know, for instance, when they're on the the C one thirty and they're about to to bomb the bridge, you know, to drop a bomb. (laughs) (laughs) He's yelling it to, um, you know, the Royal Albert Hall and is trying to reach the back rafters. Um, So, um, I I think that, um, and, and he, he wasn't the only actor with the theatric background. The, um, John Rhys Davies also had performed in in plays with Timothy, and and he joked about how there were just so many women um, at the stage door, just throwing themselves at him, and and it was um, it was just so funny to be in a play with Timothy Dalton. Um, hmm. But yeah, I mean, he he one hundred percent swung the pendulum back to Fleming, and. Um, as far as um you know influencing the filmmakers i i think he did and um it it's something that that we definitely saw with license to kill that it's it's incredibly gritty it's um it's much more down to earth um one of the very interesting things about the um that change between Daylights and License to Kill um, is in Maybaum's archive. He had um, a folder with with clippings and some box office stuff on Rambo, and that was kind of unusual. He he didn't you know when I was looking at Majesties, he didn't have you know other stuff sort of comparing action films at the time, but with Rambo he did. And um, it it definitely influenced him. And one of the the most interesting ways was that the Pam Bovier character, um, her nickname in the early scripts was Pambo. You know, instead of Rambo, <laughs> it's Pam Bovier, aka Pambo. And I mean, it's it's bizarre when I'm reading this. I'm like, okay, this you know this butch lesbian character pambo that that's not bond you know mm. that I, I was like okay where are you going with this um so um i you know i, I think that I, like when we talk about with with roger moore and people will sometimes be dismissive of oh god the fashions were horrible or i i can't stand um, Tanya Roberts or God, you know, um, Britt Eklund can't act her way out of a paper bag. Well, you know, that's not Roger's fault. You know, mm-hmm. that, that, yes, the, the lead actor can, can certainly point them in a direction, but you can't put all the sins of a film on a lead actor. Unfortunately, as fans, we often do. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that, that, Dalton had many conversations with Cubby, and, and he's talked about this, where he was not going to take the role if he was just going to be Roger Moore 2.0. You know, he's mm-hmm. like, we we have to change how these films are made. And, um, you know, not from a production standpoint, but from a story and, um, you know, acting standpoint and, and just a more serious tone and, and things like that. So um, if... I hopefully that answers his question. I, you know, I think that that Dalton had a huge influence not only on, you know, that time period, but but we're still feeling his influence today. Yeah, and, yeah absolutely. Know, it's, um, no doubt. Yeah, and that kind of leads us on into the next question here from JBL listener Matthew Noble, who says, since the making of the Living Daylights basically covers all of the Timothy Dalton area to a certain extent, at least, his questions is a what did eon's original attempts at bond 17 look like and b what would you like to have seen in a version of bond 17 that starred dalton fantastic book by the way loved it wonderful um so there are some you know script snippets floating around of of bond 17 that involves hong kong and robots and it, it it does nothing for me. I, you know, the, mm. the things I've read about it, it just like, okay, this, this seems bizarre. Um, I, um, so as, as to what 
I, I would love to see. I mean, I kind of, you know, maybe almost a. Um, I think you mentioned this, Tom, is something that you'd like to see um, Daniel go out with is is a traditional Bond versus a megalomaniac. You know that um, I, I would I would love for Dalton have to have gotten that third film that that gelled everything and you know had enough of the fun combined with his seriousness a a villain that you know where you felt that the world was in peril and that only bond could save it um that's um you know and i I think by his third film you know he, he definitely would have been so comfortable in the role and um you know would love to have had a huge budget and and things like that i mean that's um that's where i would go um i, I think know it's, he, it's somewhat he, generic but yeah he needed his gold finger or his spy love me didn't he exactly yeah, exactly absolutely so yeah. uh, what what would you say was your favorite part of the book charles like obviously when you're when you're birthing one of these creations it takes a long 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 time to, to put it all together research writing it, it editing does. and all that kind of stuff so when you when you look back at the making of living daylights what is your the, the bit that puts the smile on your face um, there's the, the double page spread of his reveal, um, where, you know, he's on the ledge and, and he hears a uh, double four scream. And so he turns to the camera. And so in, in my, um, in putting that together, I found a wonderful color photo of that uh, scene, you know, the, a lot of previous books had only had a black and white, got a behind the scenes shot of him, um, you know, waiting to film it. And interestingly enough, although that's the first time we see him, that was one of the last things filmed. Um, hmm. but, um, and so there's also, I have the storyboard of him turning, um, and the script snippet, and I'm, I'm going to read it cause it's, it's just so cool. So, hmm. uh, it's scene 40, um, third double O man on Ridge strapping on parachute container. He turns into camera. Now we see his face, James Bond at last. Nice. And you know, that's brilliant. Like, like it is. And then I also do a pull quote from special effects magazine. Um, when Dalton finally um, wins a close-up, it's a butte. He turns, an astonishingly Byronic figure, ruffled by high winds, all dimple and gaze, processing the death cry of his fellow double O agent. How perfect um, is that as a simulation? It, it, yeah, it's it just it gives me goosebumps, and so when when I'm flipping through the page, the pages of the book, you know, I'm, I'm proud of everything, but I get to that and I'm like, you know, this is, this is why I do these books. Beautiful. But also that, that iconic image, there is a, at one point that might not have happened because wasn't it originally planned to have the faces of all three double O seen on the plane before they jump, at least in an early, exactly. Uh, an early job. Exactly. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've got it behind the scenes and, you know, star log magazine also showed, you know, the, the three faces. And, um, so, you know, it's uh, like we've said, it, it was done in Dr. No, it was done in majesties and, and, you know, done again in daylights where it's this buildup and mm. it, it's just so incredibly effective, um, that that's, that's how you introduce a hero. I love that build up. It is my favorite thing when they introduce a new Bond actor. Golden Eye is obviously another one. And it, I've always said, I wish they'd have done more of that with Casino. I feel like you could have shot that. I know the bathroom fight and stuff would have been, it, it would have been harder to do, but I feel like you could have shot it in such a way where you never saw his face until he, he shoots Dryden and at the end of it. You know what I mean? And yes, considerably, and right. that would be the moment you saw him and then bang into the theme tune. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. So you mentioned uh, last time the Majesty's pre-titles was your 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 favourite scene. Um, would you say, in terms of the daylights, would the daylights pre-titles be your favourite scene, or something else in the film? Absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, it just it's it's something that you know, if I'm in a bad mood, I can put on the daylights pre-title, and <laughs> suddenly I'm not in a bad mood anymore. Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I I do I. I absolutely love the final shot of the of the film too. I mean, just the 
the close up of of the two martini glasses. I mean, that's it's <laughs> just so elegant. It, um, you know, it's just everything about um, John Glenn's choices in in daylights seemed right to me but that that is a is a fantastic final shot totally so i tell you what i'm curious about is that i you, you hear writers say in interviews all the time how you know writing the, the blank page is the worst thing when you when you write a new book and all that kind of stuff and and the whole the whole process of just birthing a piece of writing in itself must be really difficult but with with what you do with your two books you've got so much research to plow through and catalog and then work out which bits you're gonna sort of mention in what way and what order and all that kind of stuff so like what how difficult is that process and like what was the hardest part of writing the book um i i I couldn't have said it better. That is, that is, uh, um, I appreciate that, that you realize that it, it <laughs> does take a tremendous effort and, and it's, it's scary. I mean, I, you know, it's one of the things that, uh, with, with the Majesty's book that I was, I was just constantly scared that the book wasn't going to be good enough. Yeah. And, you know, when, when I got to, you know, seven or eight years in and, and had uncovered all these, you know, major revelations and and just so much cool stuff the the anxiety tapered but it's always there that you know you're you're as you said you're birthing something that that was not there previously and it it has given me uh, an incredible appreciation for how bond films are put together that it's like wow you know you've everything is a choice you know that that you can you can do it exactly as it says on the page or you can you know tweak it a little bit or you know wow you know glenn you know talks about with the unused scenes when he introduces them that that there are various reasons why he wanted to include them and various reasons why they didn't mm-hmm. and you you have to make that judgment call and that's that's what i have to do with these books and um I, it, there was one person that um you know kind of complained that well there's not a ton on the Aston Martin and you know I I'm like well you know I I had stories of how they were acquired through newspapers and you know pictures from the press conferences where you see before it's you know kitted out and you know shots of of the ones that that they the fiberglass ones they destroyed and you know I, I I'm sure that there are, there are fans out there that, you know, oh, maybe they wanted page after page of Jerome Crabbe, and they're like, well, you know, this book sucks. I'm, you, <laughs> know, <laughs> I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm taking it to an extreme, but yeah. um, it, my overarching thought when when I am crafting this is, is what hasn't been seen before and what is unusual um, yeah. that – you know, and and sometimes it's tough where there may be a very famous Bond photograph that you know we've all seen thousands of times, but it's such a great photograph. And mm. so I'm like, okay, well, do I use it? Well, no, it's been used too often, but it would really go with this other piece that I have. Um, so there there's a lot of of weighing and oh man, um, and I'm I'm slightly going off on a tangent here, but with the the majesty's book i i did get a a few nitpicking complaints that some of the photos weren't big enough and um the stuff with the unused scene um with with him um when he first discovers fidian listening in Mm. um that was from a a copy of a contact sheet so a you're you're going from a postage stamp sized um photograph and you know, if I had the original of Lazenby kicking down Fidian's door, I would have that so big you could see it. From- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's uh, typically if it's small in the book, it means that I didn't have a, an original, a transparency, a slide, a you know, gigantic scan. Um, and there are other times where it's like, well, I've got a bunch of these photographs, so you know, on their own, they're not great, but all together, they're pretty good. Mm. Um, so it, the um, to get back to your question, what's the hardest? Um, the the script stuff is is really the hardest, and 
I know for for people that that haven't gotten into Maybaum's archive, they're like, "Oh, you poor baby, you get to to read these unused Bond scripts, you know that that people would would kill for." And yeah. and so that part of it I love, obviously, but trying to digest that into something that makes sense, especially when there's so many of them, and they may only have slight variations. That that was that was the easier part of the Majesty script chapter, where they were so different. Yeah. That because he did one in sixty four, and then he did one in sixty six, and then there were a bunch in sixty seven, and they were still working on in sixty eight. And you know, so when it's when it's radically different each time, you can just hit the highlights. And, you know, when you're talking about a potential action scene or something like that, that's very exciting. But trying to digest three pages of expository dialogue <laughs> into a paragraph that makes sense when it's only slightly different than the other three scripts that you've just talked about, yeah. um, it's it's a tremendous challenge um and and so that for for this book that was that was more difficult and um a lot of late nights and coffee then (laughs) (laughs) so i suppose another interesting thing then is when when you when you finally gone through that process you you you've, you've put the whole thing together you finally published it you've put it out there into the world and then you sit back and you wait for the reviews to come in. Like, what's what's that like? Are you the kind of guy that will just, like, not read the reviews? Do you have a favorite review? Do you have a review that you're like, you bastard, how dare you speak about my book like that? <laughs> what, what, how, how, does, how is that process for you? <laughs> um, I, 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 I took the Majesty's ones very personally. I, um, the... Because the, these books are 100 percent me, you know. I'm mm. I'm the publisher. I'm the writer. I designed it, I, you know. It, I, so I can't pass the buck and be like, "Well, my designer sucks," you yes. know, because it's me. Um, but um, so at first, when there was anything that you know, um, I I kind of bristled and you know, and and to I think what what hurt me more was was people complaining about the price and and I realized that these books are very expensive you know I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not pretending that they're not but when when I'm creating them my goal is always how do I make these books better not how do I make these books cheaper yeah mm-hmm. and that's you know that as as you guys as owners of both books I'm I'm sure you can attest to it, that you know mm-hmm. you I would say that everyone that buys my book gets their money's worth. And, um, so, um, with the, the majesty's book, um, my, my favorite, um, sort of response was from, um, Michael Reed, who was the director of photography. And I, I talked about that, um, in, in my first interview with you guys where he was just so elated and, and that his grandkids thought he was cool now because he <laughs> <laughs> interviewed in this book. Um, and, um, you know, they, they got to see just, um, that whole thing. Um, with the daylights, um, John Glenn sent me a very, very nice note about how much he enjoyed it and that he not not only loved the content, but he loved the production values. Aww. So that, that you know, everything else is gravy after that. Um, <laughs> the I, I, I did get a review fairly recently of The Majesty's book that is just one word. Perfect. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, beautiful. I'll take it. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. Um, there, there was a, a sort of nitpicky, complainy review that that I laugh about now, where the guy was mad because he was reading My Majesty's book and it was so good that he got sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> Was that you, Tom? I think or... it might have been. Yeah. The, the last time I read that book, I was actually out in the sun at the time. Yeah. 
<laughs> there we go found the culprit <laughs> um so there's one one more final listener question then relating to the books uh peter brooker asks what are the complexities of getting a bond book off the ground if it's not backed by eon so that that's an interesting one now because there are so many bond books out there unofficial not related to eon but what's the sort of uh, process that you have to go through for that um you have to have to um Look for uh, the, um, you know, photographs that are um, not by their photographers. You have to um, acknowledge, you know, everywhere possible that this is, you know, not the authorized book, blah, blah, blah. Um, But to, you know, where, where I kind of, skirt the line because I, I remember too with, with the DVDs um, that they were very cautious about showing some of my collection because then they wanted to get rights clearances from, Mm. you know, the people that created the memorabilia. And that, that confused me. I'm like, okay, well, you know, you guys licensed it originally. What, Mm. what is the issue? Um, And, uh, so there's, you know, with that, if I'm showing a poster and things like that, I mean, that was that was created to be publicly displayed. And, you know, yeah, I'm I'm not putting them on T-shirts and, you know, tea cozies and, and fidget spinners. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> you know, making money off their intellectual property in a total, you know, blatant way. I mean, here I am providing information that's never been published before about how these films were made. And therefore from the people I've talked to uh, is that falls under fair use Yeah. Yeah. that because it is a scholarly, you know, analysis and, and is providing factual information about how these films were used. Um, I know that that Eon has has gone after um, people previously, but that that has been um, there was the whole thing with Stephen J. Rubin, where um, he originally, you know, had um, Eon's permission, and then he started talking to people that they weren't that wild about him talking to, mm. and then they kind of closed off. Um, you know, access to him and, and they were hurt that maybe he had changed, you know, uh, the, the parameters of, of what he had originally set out to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, thankfully I, I have not had any, any legal issues with, with my books. Um, it doesn't mean it can't happen. Um, but, I think it's the sort of thing where I'm, you know, I, I'm a small fish compared to, to what, you know, some of these other things are. Yeah. And again, under, under the fair use that, that if I just, you know, again, was, was cranking out merchandising products, you know, that's, that's where they, they draw the line because that, that hurts their bottom line, yeah. you know, yeah. it, with, with these two books, you know, is, is Eon on the cusp of, of producing an authorized making of majesties? Yeah. Not in my lifetime. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and so, and, and that's, you know, when, when I approached a few traditional publishers, they're like, well, you know, have you talked with Eon? I'm like, uh, you obviously don't know, you know, the players yeah. here because, they're they're not you know and uh, it's um a a friend of a friend um has an incredible book on um the making of the christopher reeve superman films um that that is basically in limbo because warner brothers has no interest i mean they you know they have a current superman with henry Mm -hmm. cavill and that's who they want to want to push and you know looking back at christopher reeve does does nothing for them so they're like yeah we're not going to publish this and um so every traditional publisher that that he approaches you know they don't they don't want to get on warner brothers bad side um 
So it's it's just a shame. But I, you know, I've I've gone in with okay, I've I've worked you know for the the Fleming family. I've worked for MGM. Um, uh, you know, I'm a recognized expert and I'm, I'm going to produce these books and, you know, I, I don't want to step on their toes, but by the same token, you know, uh, this, this information fans want it and, mm. you know, I'm, I'm going to deliver it. And if, if that makes them mad, then, you know, I, well, I won't do it anymore. I guess but, we, we should um, tell our listeners to go and get copies of both of your books immediately, just in case. <laughs> just in case it all goes that to... That is the subtext yeah. of what I was trying to get across. <laughs> <laughs> You're not listening, so... Indeed. So we, I guess we should we should finish up with the ultimate question, Charles, which is, you know, typically things come in threes. And we've had the making of Honor Majesty's <laughs> Secret Service. We've had the making of The Living Daylights. Are we going to get yeah. a third making of book? from Mr. Charles Helfenstein? Um, it's, it's under consideration. I know that that's <laughs> kind of what I said last time, but um, it's, you know, is, there, is there it more consideration minuses. than last time? Or, or. <laughs> <laughs> a, a little bit more. Um, a little bit more. It, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there, there are certain films where, it, like, for instance, from Rush of Love, um, there's only one script in Maybaum's archive, you know, there, there's, mm. and, and that is like 95% close to what was filmed. So, um, you know, not that uh, looking at the rest of it wouldn't be fascinating, but, um, you know, the, the script stuff of, of these two books I've published, I, I would say is, is a tremendous meat of, of the two books because it's, it's information that's never been published and it's, directions that were not used and you know mm. just just radically different stuff with mm. chimps and gorillas and and you know stuff that that fans eat up and so could i do a making of for marshall with love and and just have you know a very weak couple page script chapter you know i could but that that wouldn't really you know fit into the the series that I've created. Um, so, you know, and then I had a, a bunch of people say, oh, man, you need to do Thunderball. You need to do Thunderball. And, you know, I'm like, well, <laughs> there have been a bunch of books about Thunderball. And, um, you know, the, the, the seller's book is, is great and, and has a lot of, of detailed information. And they're like, yeah, but it's not to your level, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very kind, but by the same token, you know, I, I need these books to sell to, to recoup the insane amount of money that I spend on them. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's like I said earlier. A lot of times, it comes down to money, and and then people are like, "Oh, well, you should do a GoFundMe or whatever." And I'm like, "Well, that that's kind of putting a target on my back for you know, hey, Eon, you know, come look at this thing. I want you know that yeah. I would yeah. rather have a finished product, and um, you know, I the the Kickstarter method is is good for for some things, but I, I and then I would feel the the pressure of a deadline rather than doing it to my schedule. Um, and so that's, that's not really an option either. Um, but, and, you know, I know that I'm not, not really helping you guys, (laughs) (laughs) answered. but, um, it's, it's not an easy decision. It's, it's something that, um, when, when I flip that switch, I, you know, I I become you know like a cruise missile that like every I I have to remove all distractions and spend nothing but every waking hour tracking down information on the film and and you know who starred in it and mm-hmm. and um, the behind the scenes people and you know the rest of my life goes away and hmm. um. You know, and and with with the Majesties, obviously, I didn't do that because it took ten years. But you know, I can't do that with with the third book. And um, you know, Daylights, I I was sort of working on with Majesties. I mean, not simultaneously, but 
but I'm always collecting on on both films and, and stuff like that. And you know, when I'm in Maybaum's archive, I'm I'm looking at everything. And you know, mm-hmm. again, when there's a gigantic hole for From Russia with Love, and and Thunderball has already been been taken, and um, you know, people are like, oh, well, you know, obviously the next one's going to be Goldeneye because you've done, you know, the first two or, the, you know, the debut films of these guys and why not do Live and Let Die? And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, every, everybody has their, their own, you know, wish list. Mm-hmm. And what I want is for someone else to do it, you know, that <laughs> I, that I would I would have the entire shelf, the whole whole series if if I could pay fifty dollars or thirty five pounds and get these books, you know, yeah. I mean, they, that's, that's a no brainer. Um, and uh, you know, I, I have passion for other bond films, but I would love to have the true experts of each film, you know, the person that knows the most about them, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not discounting that I can't, you know, flip that switch and, and, you know, be like, okay, you know, I'm going to do it. And, uh, you know, th- there, there are some things that I'm, I'm circling and, and all that, but I, I don't want to get everyone's hopes up and say, yeah, the third book's definitely coming, but, um, you know, it's, it, it's working its way towards fruition. Let's put it that way. You know what, Charles, you're like the Batman of Bond books. You're the reluctant <laughs> hero that nobody else is going to clean up this town and you, you're in semi-retirement, but, but you, you, you're being tempted out onto the streets to clean it up again. I feel that's what's happening. <laughs> I, I guess it'll come to a point then, Charles, where you'll either see um, a script note or some sort of story or there'll be some some sort of hook. And if that gets True. you so excited that, that you right. can't think about anything else, then you know exactly. it's going to happen, basically. And until that happens, it's hard. You can't sort of say yes or no, can you, really? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we're praying that that does happen, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, <laughs> well, let, let me uh, flip the script on you a little bit. What are your two guys' uh, favorite parts of the book? of And each book, actually. I uh, Do you know what? Uh, I, for me, in, in, the, in the Majesty's one, it's got to be the the sort of the brief glimpse at what George's diamonds would have been. Um, that, okay. that there was that sort of sequence where you described that the, the foot chase, um, and then I believe it was somebody in a hood, and then they fall on the train tracks, pulls the hood off, and it was Irma Bunt, and she had a bag of diamonds on right. her or something, and then that was the dissolve into the theme tune. Yep. And dude, oh man, when I read that, I just my imagination <laughs> goes shit, and I just imagine what that film would have been. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> For me, the Majesties was seeing um, the deleted pictures of the scenes, like you mentioned earlier, with, with Fidian and the rooftop chase, because that's something I still right. want to reenact one day. I really want to like <laughs> find those buildings, do a bit of do a bit of parkour around London in in my uh, Lazenby suit, and and get that down at some point. But that is just fascinating because you know it helps to visualise what what it could have been which was great obviously the film would have been so long with all these bits uh, included but that was fascinating and uh, yeah yeah it is and and when you consider how much effort it would be to uh, fake the death of a minor character you know Mm. that it um and not not every action scene has to be you know the world's in peril but it, it just when you add up what that would have cost rather than just not having city in, um, I can see why they chose it. But yeah, I, um, when I got those storyboards from Sid Kane and, um, located, um, those, uh, contact sheets, um, that was, um, just, you know, I was through the moon that I'm like, okay. Cause I, you know, I was always aware of that scene and, and stuff like that, but to, to have the visual evidence is awesome. The other sort of interesting trivia with that, um, rooftop chase is that was filmed literally a couple days after the Beatles rooftop concert. So it was <laughs> like everybody was on wow. London roofs <laughs> wow. in January of 69. Um, well, actually the, um, the Fidian stuff was February 2nd, but I think the, the Beatles rooftop was January 30th. So it just wow. struck me as odd that, you know, within a couple days here, these, these, 
rooftop shenanigans. Indeed, <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for joining us again, Charles. It's always been a pleasure, and uh, we, we'd love to have I've, you back. I've really on enjoyed it, it and. It, um, I actually have some uh, suggestions for uh, some James Bond radio merchandising. Oh, yeah? Um, oh, yes. Yeah, yes. I have the fan fan posters with the Jeff Marshall style, but I'd like to have ones with the stuff that you guys misheard, so we'd have like a strawberry <laughs> trap and a, and a barracks back there on a poster, <laughs> and those would, just, those would just fly off the shelves, I think. Oh, sure, yeah. Absolutely. Good idea. That is a brilliant idea. I don't know if we can find a poster big enough for it, but uh, that's a cracking idea. <laughs> <laughs> the things you learn when you put the subtitles on, that's all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah it's been great having you back again always an illuminating chat and if if anything encourages you to write a third book is that we'd love to have you back again when you do indeed write a third awesome. one so if that encourages you awesome. then, uh, then there it is all the all the users that that are listeners that call in say i keep up the good work you're your enthusiasm is, is infectious and i i just you know i, I really love listening to the podcast and mm. um until next time. Absolutely. Indeed. It's uh, nice of you to say so. So where, where should uh, all our listeners go? Is there, a, is there a website for them to check out, a Twitter or anything like that? Where would you, where would you like to shepherd our listeners to find out more about the world of, of Charles Helfenstein's Bond? <laughs> um, I am going to be, I think, creating a, a website for my publishing company. So I will, I will let you know about that. Okay, but, sweet. Um, Fantastic. All um, right, then, Charles. Well, thanks excellent. for joining us once again. Hopefully, we'll chat to you again soon. <laughs> Yeah. Sounds good. It's been great fun. Cheers, Charles. Take care. You too, Chris. All right. Bye. Um, yes. Thanks a lot. Very nice. Do you know what? I love having Charles Helfenstein on JBR, man. It's, it's a shame he hasn't got more books and we haven't got more excuses to get him back know. on the show because it's always a good time. We always learn something and we always have a laugh as well, don't we? We do. Uh, it's the sort of thing where if he had done a book for every Bond film, that would be lining my shelf mm, right now because yeah. they if anyone hasn't had a read um you know they are sort of compared to some bomb books they are a little bit expensive yeah. but it's so worth it for the detail that you get isn't yeah. it they're just incredible that's the books, thing. Really and I, I think the, the thing is if that is something that has perhaps put you off that you're like oh that's a bit pricey the the reason for that is obviously is because of a a lot of the photos and stuff in there they, they cost a lot to license those so it's not it's not any other reason other than that that you just need to sort of like cover that cost um and the level of detail is immense and i feel like you know, if you're looking at it from a value perspective, it's like you can spend ten ninety nine on a coffee table book and you'll probably glance through it once and not really learn a whole lot because you know most of what's in there anyway. But with this, it's like an investment in your Bondian knowledge as well because there are things in there that even if you're a hardcore expert, there are nuggets in there that you wouldn't have dreamed of. And it's just so in so such an in-depth sort of study almost that it's like it is worth every penny. And like in terms of reading time, you're going to get hours of enjoyment out of it so i would i would we, i mean we both got both uh both books yeah. majesties as well as, as living daylights mine are in storage back home ready for when i return and it's just <laughs> like you know you can you could that hours and hours of entertainment so don't let that put you off get the bloody books because if nothing else if you go out and buy a load of the books from the, from charles hopefully that will stimulate him to finally write the third book which i, 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 I hope very- he does <laughs> i hope he i really hope he does i didn't this is a question though what if you were in if you could say right charles i want you to write a book on this film mm. what film would you choose it's a tough one man Cause i because yeah. i think i think the early ones would be brilliant but the trouble with that from a realistic point of view mm. it's harder to to find photos to find yeah. details and stuff the the further back you go obviously yeah. it's a lot it's a lot more difficult and you know it takes him months and months yeah. and months some like potentially years to get gather this information put it together so i don't know man i don't know what would you say I would, if, if, I, I, it's a tricky one because it's like uh, the, the, my gut reaction is like the bomb films that i love so uh, obviously majesties is a perfect example of a book that's like that's perfect for me another one i would think maybe casino royale because that's you know that's that's my second in command bond film um yeah. but then you've got the ones that have just really great stories or a lot of controversy around like you know thunderball is a perfect example but obviously a lot of things have been written about thunderball um and all that kind of stuff but obviously not in the in the helfenstein way so there is that yeah. so I don't know. It's a it's a tricky one to sort of choose 
one, I guess. But, you know, I feel like things come in threes, man. So I feel like yeah. you can't leave us hanging at two. You can't Timothy no. Dalton it. You know what I mean? No. You need you need, no. you need, need the gold finger. You need the spy love me somewhere along, yeah. on, along the way. So, Do you know what? Go on. Those were the two. Well, along the three that came into my mind were Dr. No, Goldfinger and Spy. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think Dr. No would be tricky just because how old it is. But I think... One of those Maybe three Spy would be, would be then, a good one because yeah. that that would yeah. be because obviously that was like the turning point in the in the Bond world, wasn't it? That was like the going for broke. With Harry moment. Saltzman left. Harry and Saltzman all that, left. Yeah. I bet there there must have been a lot of behind the scenes stuff that we're not privy to. That was like right. This is this could either go one way or the other. Do you know what I mean? And we're just lucky that it went yeah. the right way. Yeah. And Guy Hamilton was on it for a little bit at the start, wasn't he? And, yeah. and that had that whole story of um, Goldfinger's brother um, and all that. So there's a lot of stuff. But that, that was diamonds, though, wasn't um, it? Uh, that, uh, oh yeah, sorry. That was diamonds. Yeah. No, yeah, that was diamonds. But there was another. Wasn't there another? Um, uh, st- st- oh, I've forgotten now. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I've lost track. Right. But I know there was some. There was quite a lot of story. Thing well, it was Blofeld, wasn't it? Spy Love Me was originally yeah. going to be Blofeld instead of oh, uh, that's you right. know, instead of Stromberg. But uh, but yeah, I'm sure there's there's plenty of stuff in there. Yeah, I feel like I don't know. There's just it's all the stuff where the stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily know about. Like I find the the process of like auditioning different Bond actors and stuff like that. So yeah. I'd I'd want to you know perhaps a period where a lot of that was going on behind the scenes of like yeah. you know when Roger was like oh, I'm off this time and then he'd come back for another one like for your eyes only around that sort of time. Maybe for your eyes only would be a good one. Yeah, because that's yeah. you know there's a lot of we'll Fleming in there, and I feel like there's a lot of you know a lot of screen tests going on behind the scenes there and stuff like that but uh yeah i'm sure and i liked in in the daylights book like you get to see some of the old scripts and some of the old storylines yeah. and i think that's always really interesting oh, isn't always it? you can see how it progresses yeah. um which is really cool so and i can't believe he got he got the actual suit from oh, the pre-title mate. sequence yeah. man i'd i'd be wearing that day and night I if would i had be. that I would, they would be my pajamas every night for bed <laughs> yeah. i think yeah if, if i could have one nugget from the living daylights it would be that suit yeah. with you know it just yeah. would be that's just like to me that's the yeah. iconic if i shut my eyes and think of timmy's bond i think of him running down that hill about to jump on the jeep in that outfit so yeah man oh mate i just that's such a cool little thing to own that is amazing <laughs> But, uh, nice. but yes, so make sure you go to Amazon, get yourself a copy of, of both books or one or the other, if, if uh, whichever one floats your boat. But uh, definitely can't recommend them highly enough. It's not just because we've had Charles on the show. They are genuinely works. They are genuine masterpieces. They're like, you know, love letters for the fans in a sense for the, uh, for the films, for the two films. So make sure you go and get a copy. And then like we say, hopefully Charles will write a third one and uh, we can have another excuse to get him back on the show. But uh, there we go. Definitely. Cool stuff. Sounds- so, should we find out the answer to the trivia question from uh, Christian Evangelista this week, Chris? Yeah, let's have another listen to it and then see, let's see uh, what we come up yeah. with. What is the name of the very particular cuff that Sean Connery wears on his shirts in all of his films except Goldfinger? So that would be in Dr. No, From Rush With Love, Thunderball, You Only Live Twice, Diamonds Are Forever, and in Never Say Never Again. And for a bonus, who are the two other actors who portrayed James Bond who wore these cuffs in their films and which films? Right then, Chris. Are you, would you yes. call yourself like a, a, an expert in the sartorial matters of Bond or is that an area that you don't really focus on all that much? I definitely wouldn't say I'm an expert. I've, I've, you know, you hear things when you watch documentaries and stuff like that. So there's a few things I've picked up on, but um, I know there are some people. I'd imagine this question, David Zaritsky He'd he know would that, know him just like immediately, that. wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah for sure. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I think there are certain people and, and that side of Bond is their thing. Um, Remit, he'd be another yeah. one from Bond Lifestyle. He'd yeah. know it straight away. So I've got an idea, perhaps not about the other Bonds, but in terms of... Basically, of what he's question, done is yeah. he's posed this question to the two scruffiest dressers in the in the Bond <laughs> fan community, when you know Remit and and David obviously would would be experts. So the, okay, so let's tackle the first half. The the special yes. type of cuff, I'm pretty sure, is the cocktail cuff. Is the is the Co- answer to that? Is that does that ring bells with you? Oh, in terms of names, I don't know. I remember him saying it was buttoned, like the initial one was buttoned and not cufflinks. Right. I remember that. Um, I can't. I don't know what the name is. I remember it was turned back, 
but it didn't have cufflinks. But I don't know what that particular color is called. Right. Maybe it's called what did you call I, it? Sorry? I think it's the cocktail cuff. That's a name that rings okay. a bell with me. But like I say, I'm I'm certainly not a a expert in the ways of that kind of stuff myself. Um, so okay, so let's 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 say that's a potential. Um, what cool. about the other two Bond actors that used that particular <laughs> cuff as well? Now I'm gonna I'm I don't know. So I'm just gonna I'm no. gonna use my powers of of of, of thought to to make a, an educated guess. I'm gonna say Lazenby probably didn't because they were perhaps going for yeah. a different look for George. I'd or do you think maybe right. they did because it's like they gave him the Connery haircut? So maybe the Connery cuffs too. No, I think I think I think they probably didn't with Lazenby. So um, I don't. I would say they probably didn't with Roger as well. I feel like that's yeah. that was a different. So I my guess is. Timmy and Daniel. I reckon those two perhaps do. Yeah, I think that, that could be a good show. I remember something about Daniel, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Because I it's feel tricky. like both of those dudes, it was very much like, right, let's get back to the core of Bond. And that would be yeah. a nice little touch of, of like going back to the beginning with Sean stuff. So I, that's that's my guess. I'm happy to go yeah. with those two. Yeah, right, I'm happy cool. to go with those. So yeah, let's find out good. if that is indeed correct or I've just made a monkey of myself. Let's do it. <laughs> Hey Tom and Chris, this is Christian Evangelista with the answer to my trivia question. And the answer is turnback cuffs or cocktail cuffs. They're similar to French cuffs in that they fold back on themselves, but you don't fasten them with cufflinks, you actually fasten them with a button. And they were introduced to the series by director Terence Young, who had a liking, liking for them. And the two other actors who wear them in their films are Roger Moore in Live and Let Die and The Man with the Gold Gun, and Daniel Craig in Spectre. Thanks again for all your good work on the show, and this is your man in Washington, signing off. All right, so between the two of us, we kind of halfway got there. You had the turn back stuff, so you you kind of had the traditional name, and then I got the cocktail thing and the buttons. So we we got that bit right. Now, what I find interesting is the other two Bond actors. So it was Roger in Living Let Die, Man with the Golden Gun, who had him, and Daniel Inspector. I would have just assumed it would have been Casino Royale that he had those in. But yeah, interesting. Now, for me, Roger's the probably the biggest surprise out of the two because mm. we mentioned like he was trying to be completely different to Connery yeah. wasn't he with it not ordering the, the vodka martini and having a cigar yeah. instead of a cigarette and stuff like that so it's strange that those two he had the um that style of cuff but they're great question i mean yeah great question yeah tricky one. absolutely good stuff nice one mr evangelista good stuff good to hear from you um okay so next up it's time for chris <clears throat> mm-hmm. the guess the quote round Bon, 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 bon. James Bond. Lovely stuff. So, I like that. Yes. That was nice. I think it was your quote last time, wasn't it? Now, this is obviously going back it a was. good while now because we've oh, had man, two Oh, man, it feels into, like ages yeah. since we've done so this. So, I can't ages even remember what your quote was now because obviously we've had two, okay. two sort of other episodes in between. So, give us a reminder. Yeah. What was it? Okay. So, my quote um, last time was, <clears throat> that's it, 100 honours and 90 below. Shit. One more time. Okay. <clears throat> That's it. A hundred honors and ninety below. Is it a view to a kill? No. Then I've got no. no idea. A lot earlier. A lot earlier. A hundred honors. Not- Is it a casino a lot- scene? It, um, it's not in a casino, but it's it's it is kind of like a gambling y type scene, a card gambling type scene. Uh, oh, but not, but not, uh, is it Mr. Strangways? <laughs> the very first line ever heard in a James Bond film is, that's it, 100 honours and 90 below. Well, how about that's that? That's the very first line of dialogue, that's, man. That's, you, well, that's a, we've had a lesson today. We've learned something thanks to that quote. That's a good one. Nice. Cool, good stuff. yeah. And you got Strangways. Nice yeah, one. That, it's, it's funny Thrill. when you said super early and it's a card game, then mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, yeah, it all slips into place. <laughs> Nicely done. Good cool. stuff. So, nice game well, of bridge there. I, well, I need to learn how to yeah. play bridge, actually, because that was, that was a Fleming yeah. game, and wasn't it? Yeah. And and every other All those old school games, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think the only one that I'm good at is high card draw from World of Not Enough, where you just turn over a card. Yeah, <laughs> my game of choice is snap. Like, I can deal with that one. Yeah, there's, there's enough. <laughs> Why have they not used snap in Bond? <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> that would be so good. That would be good. <laughs> Love it. Snap. 
Right. Um, right. <laughs> so my quote of the week, Chris, is this one. <clears throat> Lovely view. Ooh. I'm going to do it for you again. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> Lovely view. Oh. Oh. There's, there's a couple of things that come to mind. There's one which which I think is potentially the one, but then there's another which is very similar. Yeah. That's good. I like yeah, that one. Good stuff. Nice. Now, nice uh, obviously, harking back to our last JBR episode, we had a listener quote from Mr. Alex <coughs> Robson, which we still haven't resolved because it's been mm-hmm. so long since the last last one. Yeah. So should we have a little reminder of what Alex's quote was? Yeah, let's have a let's listen. Thanks, Alex. Perfect. Once again, Perfect. Okay, so that conjures up a couple of things. I thought it was, uh, what's his name? It escapes me now. The dude in the world is not enough with the trainers in the bag. Uh, what's his oh, name? Davidoff. Davidoff. Is it? That's who no. I thought it was. But he yeah, doesn't yeah. say perfect. He says excellent. So oh, yeah, that yeah. is not Davidoff. At least I think he says excellent. I'm pretty sure he does. Perfect. I think there's a couple of options here. And I, I have, you, have you got a scent? Have you, are you on the, are you on the, well, the, the one that came to mind straight away when I heard it last time was, now I don't know if this is it because I'm sure get, the trouble is with the one word things, yeah. sometimes they get said more than once in the series. Um, the one, shall I just say the one that came Go to mind in. for me yeah. was from The Living Daylights after Cara makes the vodka martini and she says to him, did I get it right? And he goes, perfect. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. And that's what came to mind straight away, but I'm sure there are other times it's, so it's said. Th- so it is. I'm pretty sure when Henderson hands him the the vodka martini and you only twice, he says, stir, that was shaken, that was right. Yeah. And doesn't he go, perfect. I think, I think he does. might do, yeah. But he I, does, yeah, I no, feel like... The, yeah, mm, perfect. yeah, he does. Yeah. So Connery says it. Yeah. Dalton says it. I think Craig might... Does someone else say it? I can't remember. Which one came to mind for you first? The Dalton one, Living Daylights, for sure. The Dalton sure. one, yeah. yeah. So I think, like, and I, I, yeah, I feel like that. I feel like there's something in his delivery that's Dalton esque, and I feel like yeah. that's the, that's the one I'm leaning towards anyway. Yeah, yeah. Should we? Me too. Should yeah, we have right. a listen I'll, and see I'll, if yeah. we've got it right? Yeah, yeah. Let's do let's it. Let's do it. Hey guys, Alex Robson calling back with the answer to my quote, which was perfect. And that was my best delivery, as best as I can, uh, channeling my Daniel Craig. And that would be at Skyfall when he receives his Vespa um, at the casino. So I hope you got it right. Keep up the great work, as always, chaps. Speak to you soon. Bye. Oh, man. I thought Daniel might have said it, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't see the scene in my head. Yeah. And, I, and Sean definitely said it. And But I... God, it sounded so much like Dalton did, when he said it, it but obviously, yeah. it, obviously, um, he, that yeah, was Craig the other it. one. Yeah. Great, qu- yeah, great quote though. Superb, yeah. um, tricky, tricky, very tricky. Absolutely, but, yeah, nice one. So there you uh, go. Great. Cheers, Alex. Alex has a, a slightly Dalton-esque flavour to his portrayal of Daniel's Bond. So we're getting in the weeds there, aren't we? With possibilities, it's, it's getting a bit deep there, a bit, bit matrixy, it I is. guess. But uh, there you go. Yeah. All right, cool. So we have a new listener quote this week from elite JBR family member Jack Taylor. Jack Taylor was obviously one of the last men standing when we went to see Spectre and we were at the uh, the casino on Leicester Square drinking until the early hours of the morning. Jack was one of the the the, the, the last men there. So let's uh, let's have a listen to what Jack has for us. Hey guys, it's Jack Taylor here from the States just calling in with the listener quote. So here it goes. Okie. Okie. All right. It's short, but sweet. Hopefully you guys can get that one. Um, thanks for having me on and thanks for all the hard work that you guys are putting in a lot of time and effort and it's, uh, it's showing up in the podcast. So here's to a great year of JBR in 2017 and, um, best of luck to you guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, do you know what that is? Are you on the track there? Cause I must admit, I'm a little bit stumped on that one. I think I do now. <laughs> I think I do. Oh my god! I think it's just popped in. Oh, yeah? If it's not that, no, it must be that. Ah, oh, I think it. I think I've got an idea. Right. And it, yeah, I think so. All right, but I'll wait and see. We'll, we'll see yeah. wait and see. Do you? And 
Is there any sort of tingles your end? Any? I would. Any I would. Ideas, something or? about that delivery makes me think of yeah. of like maybe you only live twice or something. I, uh, whether I, I'm on the right right sort of scent or that, I don't know. But uh, but yeah, a good one. I like those ones yeah, that just nice just like there's something in them, but you can't quite get them. Yeah. They're my favourites. But yeah, uh, great quote. That. Nice, nice one, Jack. Jack. Good to hear from you, buddy. Okay, Chris. I hope you've prepared yes. yourself because it is now time for. Who wrote the score? Who lived and died? Who played Helga Brandt and how did she die? Who wants to stop trial the water in Bolivia? It's Tommy Trivia. That's right, it's time for Tommy Trivia. So, for the uninitiated, this is where Chris takes a random card out of the 007 Trivial Pursuit deck and teases me with the questions and hopefully i get them right which sometimes i do and sometimes i don't so chris what have you got for me this time i think um we are going to start this time with your favorite bond film i won't say what it is okay but this is vehicles so tom bond defies death on a cable car in on her majesty's secret service Mm. and which other Bond movie. He defies death on a cable car. That would have to be Moonraker. I am 100% sure you're right. Mm. Nice one. So. I can't okay. look at cable cars without thinking of Bond. Every time I see a cable car, I know. I'm just like, I feel like I need to be in there fighting somebody. Yeah. And, and car washes. Yeah. Same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we actually went to the car wash as well. Um, the May Day Tibet car oh, wash. Oh, nice. But- but we couldn't go through because we had a massive coach. So we ended up just like stra- stra- standing there and strangling each other. It was so funny. We walked up on the coach. We walked across this petrol forecourt, um, just just bypassed all the petrol pumps, went straight to the um, car wash and just started strangling each yeah. other. And obviously we got a few strange looks. I'm but it was sure you did. Nice. Great fun. Um, okay, on to gadgets and weapons. When Bond arrives in North Korea, where is his Walther P99 hidden? Up his arse. It might as well have been Chris in that film, let's be, sure, <laughs> let's be honest. It fucking might as well have been Barrel First. Um, yeah. That would be, oh, I can't believe I'm even saying this, it's in his fucking surfboard. It is in his fucking surfboard, and I'm sure that's exactly what it says, in his fucking yeah. surfboard. Yes, Tom, well done, you got surfboard. it right. Two out of two. So, on to locations question. In which city does Elliot Carver launch his new global satellite network? Uh, his new global satellite network, that would be Ralph's hometown of Hamburg, Germany. It would indeed. Superb, Tom. Very nice. That's three out of three. I'm doing well Cruising so far. Cruising it. Cruising it. Okay, I think you'll get this next one. Crew and behind the scenes, who are the two producers of Dr. No? The two producers. Uh, <laughs> that would be Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman. It would. Now, sometimes these questions are a little bit easy, mm. so we do yeah. apologise for that. But then, you know, you always get the odd little stinker in. Indeed. But there we go. Okay, casting characters. Joe Don Baker starred in The Living Daylights and which two other Bond films? That would be Goldeneye and Tomorrow Never Dies. Amazing. Mm. Superb, Tom. Right, one more for the, for the win. To, to get the whole set to, for the win. So this, char- um, this is based on the films. And I think this is a good one. When Bond introduces himself to Osato, who does he say he is? Mr. Fisher. Yes, superb, mate. Nice. Amazing. Six out of six, 100%. Wicked. I've had, a good, I've had a good round this week. I feel proud of myself. I feel good. Good stuff. Excellent. I like it when that cool. happens. I tell you what I also like. I like it when there's a question where we're like, hold on a minute. Is that right or not? And then we have to pass it out yeah. to the family. And then, and then by the, the group hive brain of the JBR family, we, we, we learn something about the world. You know, that's, it's good. That's a really interesting point. Do you think if, like, we put all the JBR family's minds together mm. and melded all of the Bond knowledge and stuff like that, it would just be like a global superpower yeah. of brain power <laughs> yeah this is getting into the world of Drax and Stromberg isn't it like trying to build a master a bit, master yeah. brain or something that potentially is a Bond 25 plot yeah. but uh, maybe we've got one like yeah. beneath our sort of uh, fingertips absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> so next up it's time for Tom 
is to music you. That's right. It is time for Guess the Music Cue. So again, we're going to have to have a little reminder of what the last one was. So should we just plow on and listen to last time's I music I think we cue? should do, yeah. This one's quite a, quite a good one, this one. Cool. That's a very mysterious sounding piece of music, that one. I, I'm thinking that's a Daniel piece. I'm thinking you might be right. I'm thinking, is it from Spectre? I would say a bit earlier than Spectre. A bit earlier than Spectre. Is it? I, well, well, which uh, which composer do you think it is? See, my initial thought was old Thomas Newman, but I'm guessing that's probably wrong. I'd I'd go with Dan, uh, David Arnold. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that subtle hint. That that helps point me in the right direction. <laughs> um, I is it Quantum of Solace? I would say it's not oh, Quantum Solace. All right, then. Is it Casino Royale? <laughs> I'd say yes, it's Casino Royale. Well done, Tom. Uh, so he's doing ooh, a bit of Bond sneaky. I know what ooh, it is. Yeah. I know what it is, yes. I think. I think I do. Is it when he's at the Ocean Club and he's scoping out in the little surveillance room and you're looking at the cameras? Yes, it is. Sweet. Well done, nice. man. Brilliant. Again, when it just pops in. Yeah. That's, a good, that's a nice little music cue. There. I do like the subtle ones. But when he's doing something a bit, you know, sneaking around and stuff, yeah. and I really like that cue. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. So that's where he's checking out all the CCTV stuff. Absolutely. Indeed. Very nice. Now, I do have a new Guess the Music cue for you this week. I think this one is a bit more recognisable. Okay. Um, a little bit louder as well. All right. Should we have a listen? Let's do it. <laughs> Lovely. I like that. I instantly know what film that's from, as I'm sure 100% yeah. of our listenership know what it is as well. Yeah. As to what scene it is, I mm. think I'm on the ball with that as well. Obviously, because we recently yeah. did the Goldfinger score Music of Bond episode. Oh. There's a little hint in there that I'm like, oh, yeah, it's from that particular scene. And if I hadn't have done that episode oh. with John, I probably, that wouldn't have come to mind. So I think I'm on the right track with that yeah. one, Chris. I think you might be. You're sounding confident. Yeah. That's always good. All right. Always good to go with your gut. Cool stuff. Now, next up, obviously, it's time for... <clears throat> What's the next line? Very good. Now, what's the next line for the uninitiated is a bit like guess the quote, but it's the next line is the answer. And we have to perform it in the style of the axis. Now, this listen, listen, man, I know sometimes these get challenging, right? And I know that yeah. sometimes they get difficult. And I know sometimes for both of us, we sit here and we're like, damn it, what is it? And I'm going to throw you a bone this week and I'm going to make this as right. easy as it possibly could be, right? But what really? I'm looking for, what I'm scoring you on this week, man, right. I'm scoring you on enthusiasm of performance and I'm, I'm scoring <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm scoring you on enthusiasm of performance authenticity of the performance and and accuracy of the performance okay I'm normally pretty accurate now what, now what I what I I don't want any hesitations I want you to just right. feel it I want I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. feed you my line and then I, I want your answer line to come straight back at me, 100% full pelt, no messing about, no preparations, right. <laughs> just feeling it, okay? This this is nerve-wracking. I'm sure okay. it is. I'm nervous I normally, for you. I normally don't get the nerves, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having difficulty right. performing. Are you ready? Do you need a glass, do you drink oh, yeah. of water or anything, or are you okay? Are you ready to go? <sighs> no, I, I, I'm going to go for it, okay. I think. So here right. we go. My feeder line to you this week, Chris, is... You're not thinking of... I sure am, boy. Very nice. There it is. I like it. Good stuff. I like it. Wicked. It's nice. Did I manage to perform? Good. Did I get my enthusiasm and performance? You did. That was you a, did. The precursor. Did I hit the mark? You did, man. The precursor to one of the greatest stunts in the history of film, not just Bond, but there it is, the old barrel roll jump. So uh, Super. There we go. Good stuff. Maybe I'll, I'll nice do Cheers. a more challenging one for you next time, but that felt good. Well, yeah. I'm, I might have to repay you the favour next time. All right, good stuff. <laughs> the pressure will be on. Indeed. So to finish up today's episode, we have... Bond girl battle. Oh, James. Day and night. Go on about the mechanism. 
<laughs> I love that. Sweet. That is cool, isn't it? So we are deep. We are deep deep into round two of bongo battle obviously this is where we draw two random top trumps cards from the bongo set and we we make them like make out with each other a little bit and stuff which is always good fun <laughs> um, so so far in round two the our current winners who have gone on to round three are anya amasova holly yes. goodhead xenia on a top solitaire and Wai Lin. so yeah. should we pick out this week's contestants chris let's do it so here is my lovely sombrero there it is. Bong girls are in now really what <sighs> Okay, because right, sometimes you talk about if they are in a, the Bond girls are in a fight with each mm. other. Sometimes you talk about who's the hottest mm. and whatever. I think it's basically who's the best Bond girl. That's what we want, isn't it? Who's the best Bond girl? Well, I feel, Is that right or not? I, I'm guessing, yeah, but the, it's it's kind of like rated on various characteristics, isn't it? It's kind of yeah, like it's, it, you can be the best Bond girl, but then it's like there are things that make up the best one girl. Like we often say about Tracy, she doesn't yeah. mess around. She's like, she holds her own in a fight and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. so there are, there's multiple characteristics, I would say. Cool. All right. So let, let me know when you want me to. Pick. All right. Stop. Okay. Um, hang on a second. Two came out then. <laughs> hey. Here we go. All right. And again. Stop. Okay. Right. So, the first one we have is I'm half Greek and Greek women like Electra Ooh. always avenge their loved ones. We have Melina Havelock. She's there a she tough is. cookie, that one. She's going to, she, she is. is a tough cookie. Yeah. And she's got a signature okay. weapon as well, which makes her even tougher. She, which, mm. yeah, she certainly has. Ah, oh, and uh, playing against her, we have the bubbles tickle my Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky. Polar even Nova. Very now, nice. I mean, yeah, this is I, this isn't so much a battle, I think, is it? But let's let's have a little let's have a little. Why thing is anyway. it so not what, so much a battle? Are you putting them both in a mental jacuzzi together, or what? What's going on? Oh, hello. Yes, please. <laughs> um, no, so okay. Let's start with Melina. Then, what are the positives for Melina? She, like you said, she, crossbow. She's got a crossbow, Chris. And I tell you what else. Yeah. She's like on a mission. If you mess with Melina and you and you murder her parents, like you're going to know about it. Do you know what I mean? She's she's <laughs> relentless. And those eyes of hers strike fear into the deepest part of my soul. And imagine if Great she was your missus, like, and like we often say you know sometimes you come home or whatever and the missus got the ump with you or whatever and you're like oh my god can you imagine closing the door hi darling i'm home and then she looks at you with those eyes you'd be like oh fucking hell and you'd, you'd want to yeah, run a mile wouldn't you, you you wouldn't turn your back on her no you otherwise would, you'd be you certainly would <laughs> so, yeah. yeah you put a yeah, foot definitely. wrong and that's it game over yeah. so yeah she's and- she's 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 a badass i like it and she's a good character in terms of what about her relationship with Bond then? Obviously, she's on her own mission. Mm. Bond kind of gets involved with that. Yeah. Um, and and nothing happens, really happens between them until the end, does it, in mm. terms of that way? Yeah. At least, I don't think so. Um, but yeah, no, so she, yeah, she's great. And obviously, that whole attack on uh, St. Cyril's, yeah. she's great in that as well, isn't she? Mate, she's, she, I um, tell you what, mate, I think she's a strong contender yeah. to go all the way, that one, because she's yeah. multi-skilled. She's got the crossbow. She's obviously, like you say, she, the attack on St. Cyril's, she's there. She's skilled at underwater stuff and scuba underwater, diving. Underwater, yeah, brilliant. And, you know what that? I mean? Yeah. She's, got a, she's got a lot of skills going on there, yeah. Good at holding her breath as well. Indeed, very much so, yeah. yeah. Very much like BB Doll, and they're she, good at with their breath. She's got a breath very control. strong sense of like being able to look into the future and know that she should leave her air canister in a specific spot at the bottom of the sea so like, that's prophetic. quite incredible isn't it yeah that is good mm. definitely okay so let's have a look at polar even over then what do we think of polar polar is a obviously she's she was pretty much meant to be Anya Amasova for five minutes there. So she's obviously yes. highly trained like Anya would have been. So she's, you know, she's an opposite number for Bond. Um, yeah. She's... She betters Bond in the fight. She, um, out, she does. When they come out there. She, like she basically, she's... Yeah. yeah. I tell you what, she betters Bond in the fight. However, she is outsmarted by Bond fairly easily that with the true. tapes. So very true. maybe her Tchaikovsky was what sort of distracted her there and she was thinking too much about that rather than keeping her her ear on the job so to speak yeah i think you're probably right um obviously not a main bond girl character either but she is a looker and in fact um fiona fullerton that played poly vanova was desmond llewellyn's favorite bond girl really 
I think, yeah, be- purely because I think he fancied her so mm. much. And uh, he might have been on set during the jacuzzi scene. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good old Desmond. But yeah, 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 Desmond was was a, a big fan. But I think in terms of the character, Malene is just so strong. Obviously, main Bond girl. I, th- I think for me, it's got to be Melina. I think. Yeah. What do you? I think. I think yeah? it's a, it's an open and shut case. That one. It's got to be Melina. Definitely. Yeah. There we are. Melina Havelock mm-hmm. progressing to the next round. Absolutely. So we've not got many left. We've literally only got two. Oh, we're going to have to have a three way uh, <gasps> next week. Oh, it's and stuff then of dreams, we'll Chris. Go, yeah, and then we'll go into the quarterfinals. All right. Uh, Nice one. Good stuff. So So that about wraps up this week's episode of James Bond Radio. Obviously, we've been talking Living Daylights again. We've got uh, Mr. Charles Helfenstein on on board, and we learned a lot and had a good old chat. So that was good. Had a lot of fun. Next time, in two Mm -hmm. weeks' time, it is time for the JBR family to have their say. Oh, yes. It is time for the 90-second review episode of the Living Daylights. So this, I believe, will probably be the final Living Daylights episode. So make sure you come over to jamesbondradio.com, click the Leave Us a Voicemail tab on the far right of the page and tell us what you think about the Living Daylights in 90 seconds or less. I'm excited. I always really enjoy these episodes. Number one, because we don't have to do a great deal because the the listeners make the episode for us in a sense. But (laughs) I also like to hear the opinions of the JBR family because I tell you what, man, they from what i've gathered from the the listener figures of our living daylights review episodes absolutely outrageously through the roof the part two one went straight into the number one spot all-time downloads like within the crazy, three days it? absolutely mental and it's this showing, showing no signs of slowing down either um it's getting on for like 20,000 downloads almost, it's, which is just outrageous. Um, so there is some deep, deep love for The Living Daylights, but there's also a few dissenting voices amongst the ranks as well of people saying, you know what, I wasn't that into Timmy, I wasn't that into it, blah, blah, mm. blah. So it's going to be interesting to, to get it from the horse's mouth, from the JBR family itself, the hive mind, and see what the, the general consensus is. So I'm really looking forward to that. Are you? Oh, without a doubt. They're always good, the listener reviews. Yeah. And I think... The more we get, it's the more sort of variety you get in terms of you know everyone's opinions and mm. stuff. It's just great, isn't it? And but you're right, daylights has gone down so well. So I think we will probably get quite a few sort of um, yeah. reviews that praise it. But 90 seconds isn't a lot. No. I know some people have difficulty recording and then they cut mid sentence and then they send in another one and they cut mid sentence. Yeah. So you've got to you've got to really time it right. Yeah. Um, and, and get whatever flicks your switch about it or, or, or whatever, you know, you've got to, you've got yeah. to nail it really, haven't you? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, in addition as well, just a quick shout out, in addition to the 90 second listener reviews, if anyone's got any listener trivia, be sure to send those in as well. All you need to do is a question, send in a second voicemail with the answer, and then we can uh, play some more listener trivia. That's as well. right. We've got plenty so, of listener quotes and we were just running a little bit yeah. short of the listener trivia questions. So if you want to appear on the show, make sure you, uh, you leave us one of those as well. Good stuff. And then, of course, if you haven't yet, come and donate to the Sir Roger Moore uh, UNICEF Fund. That's jamesbondradio.com forward slash Roger. So until next time, James Bond Radio will return. I've been Tom Sears. I've been Chris Wright. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks. We'll see you then. See you then, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.